This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. Gotham City, like any other large metropolis, abounds in girls of all shapes and sizes. Debutantes, nurses, stenographers, and librarians. Gotham City Library, Miss Gordon speaking. Lopez hair removal, this is Jose. Holy transformation. One minute, plain Barbara Gordon, librarian and Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And the next minute... Something new has been added. Batgirl, modeled after her idol, Batman. Holy apparition! No, boy, wonder I'm Batgirl. You are no longer alone, Cape Crusader. It took me three years to track down the Jade Gato, and three more to figure out how to steal it. Funny, it only took me ten minutes to figure out how to snatch it back. No matter how you do it, crime doesn't pay girls. I hope he's home. Why does it sound like I'm using a phone in the UK? I told you never to call me again. Yeah. I know. And modern science has yet to create a device to measure how much I don't care. Look, I'm getting the trailer for this year's JL May together, and I assumed I had to make you a part of it since you're always in everybody's trailer or something. <laughs> well, look at you leading this year's JL May. Somebody's wearing his big boy pants. So what's the theme? I sent you an email like a month ago. Like I even pay attention to anything you send me. Countdown to Infinite Crisis. Infinite Crisis? No, Countdown to Infinite Crisis. I'm not following. Shocking. The theme this year, I'm, I'm going to, like I'm talking to a child. The theme this year is Countdown to Infinite Crisis. I thought it was a fascinating time period in DC's history. So a bunch of us are getting together to talk about the various specials and miniseries and crossovers that led up to Infinite Crisis. It's the event before the event. 
The whole thing is going to kick off on April 30th, 2020, with a special episode of Views from the Long Box covering the Countdown to Infinite Crisis 80 page giant, and from there, a whole bunch of shows that I will be adding in post production will discuss these previously mentioned miniseries and crossover issues. And people actually agreed to this? Shockingly, yes. Well, it's probably a good thing that you're going to cover Countdown to Infinite Crisis instead of the Countdown series, because that was a train wreck. Yeah, you know, actually, that was my thinking, too. Now, are you going to help me with this trailer or not? Fine. I will help you with your little trailer. Good. Uh, Don't worry, by the way. There won't be any dates for you to get wrong. I hate you so much. JL May 2020. Countdown to Infinite Crisis. The event before the event. This crossover kicks off on April 30th, 2020, on Views from the Long Box, and continues into Aquaman and Firestorm, the Fire and Water podcast, Robin, Everyone Loves the Drake, Pop Culture Affidavit, It All Comes Back to Superman, The Fan Holes Podcast, Justice's First Dawn, The Birds of Prey Podcast, Married with Comics, The Coffee and Comics Podcast, The Long Box Crusade, Task Force X, Relatively Geeky Presents, Wonder Woman, Warrior for Peace, and the Dr. DC Podcast. The Acro the Oracle is also brought to you by MileHighComics.com, your new and collectible comic book store. Mile High Comics has an inventory of over 5 million comics from the gold, silver, bronze, and modern age, and over 100,000 trade paperbacks. If you're not into the vintage stock, Mile High Comics also has a subscription service called the New Issue Comics Express, offering a discounted price for comics ready to hit the shelves. If you're looking for vintage ish, uh, back issues or a great modern subscription service, be sure to check out milehighcomics.com. And they actually sent, I get their newsletter and they're normally, I think they're like the nicest business ever. And they sent out like the most angry that I've ever seen them. It was, I think it was, it had a DC logo and like a cross through. It was like, we hate DC s- sale of some sort, just because DC is getting rid of their diamond distributors. So that's obviously going to hit a lot. So I, I feel it. Well, we're doing another video podcast because we're in, unpre- I know, unprecedented times. Why not do something special? The nice thing about video podcasts, oh, the nice thing about video podcasts is that, you guys on YouTube get it uncut and it's there. So if you, you can see all the flaws and everything, but there aren't any musical cues. So you have to wait for that later, but you also get fancy facial expressions. And if I crack up, you'll see it live. Yes. So w- yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish you were muted the entire time. Wouldn't that be a fun episode? <laughs> so with me, you can see this guy. He actually needs a lot of prayer. In 1993, this guy was traveling to Latveria. And he was actually captured, held hostage for three years. And in that time, he encountered what people call the Stockholm Syndrome. And so he is now, he has turned towards his captors. He is an acolyte of Dr. Doom. He loves him. Look at this. Look at this. It is, I like to call him Professor Cheapskate. (laughs) You can call him Professor Quarterbin. But it is Professor Alan Middleton. Welcome. I like to think of myself as Stella's second favorite professorial guest. Oh, okay. Okay. So, who Karen knows? Coca, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I wonder what that would look like if I had um, a, a bracket of all my guests and, and I put it out and then people voted and then it got narrowed down and then who was the, the best guest. That would be interesting to do. Though Michael Bailey always says that I try to, I try to stir the pot and create controversy where there doesn't no, need to be any. No, <laughs> I don't, I don't see that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's great to have you on. I feel like you've not been on before, have you, besides the Colin shows? Um, I believe I have been on once before. Uh-oh. <laughs> No. Um, are you going to remind me? <laughs> are you just going to sit there doing what you're doing? I'm I trying to so. think. I do not remember what we talked about. I believe we did. I know you have been on the Quarterbin show a I couple of have. times. Those yeah. are the two you've, uh, two you've listened to. Yes, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually thinking about you because I thought, was this the first time that I was on? I remember we did an out-of-context 25-cent 
Birds of Prey, but I think that was actually Bruce Wayne Fugitive Murderer, wasn't it? I th- that, that sounds right. Yeah. So, but it's good I to have you we, on. Did we do Girl Frenzy too? I think did we you also did that. For some Girl yeah. Frenzy books, I think so. Yeah. Yep, yep. So this is this has been at a year plus in the making. I think. I think I put you down, or you either requested it, or I thought, "What well, do you, you want to do, Officer Down?" But it was like so far away, and now here we are. But it's good because it's like my summer blockbuster, so it's actually a special time to potentially do it. Uh, it's also a weird time just because of the the stuff in the nation that's currently going on with with police and and everything like that. And I just want to say that with everything that's going on, we certainly, Alan and I, our hearts go out to everybody. And we are, I mean, this podcast loves all types of people. It's pro-people, basically pro-humans. And so we just hate those people that hate. Um, And so, yeah, all I can say is that we're praying for the nation and hoping that something turns around. But yeah, it's disheartening to turn on the news and see what's going on, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we're here to somewhat give you an escape. And I mean, when we talk about Officer Down, I I think it will come back a bit to current events. Just there's a particular speech that Jim has that I really want to dig into a bit. But what's funny is I want to talk about Arsenal football a bit. Victoria Concordia (laughs) Crescent. That's Latin, folks. Um, It's funny because I think I was aware that you were a fan. And when I visited you in Ohio, yes, there it is. But I've only recently become a fan. And so then I realized like, oh, wow, now we have this this connection. I actually saw England's uh, lady team, women's team play. Yeah. Whoa. 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 uh (laughs) Oh, goodness gracious. I recently saw them play in the um, She Believes Cup yep. in Jersey. And so that was really exciting. So I had just started to get to know the players a bit more. And then Arsenal, I th- I've latched onto them. And so during quarantine, when I was grading or um, planning, I would go on their website and just watch old games. So I've been, I've been doing that, which has been a lot of fun. But yeah, do you prefer the men or the women's or are you just Arsenal all the way? Well, the men's side is the one that's easier to see on TV. Yeah. And there are a lot more podcasts about it. There's one monthly podcast about the Arsenal ladies. And so it's just easier to keep up with the with with the men's side. Although from watching the game, I've watched actually a lot of like college soccer uh, around here. And I like the women's game in general just because it's it's just a little different pace and easier to follow. Yep. And so I enjoy, I mean, they're different games. I think it's uh, Mm -hmm. just important to, to, to recognize that. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was certainly looking forward to really both sides of the Olympics here in 2020 uh, for that, for that tournament, but that gives us next year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I've watched, I've had season tickets to UVA soccer, women's soccer for a long time. And sometimes I'll have a double night. And if you have a ticket, you can stay mm-hmm. for uh, the men's later on. And just, I feel like the women have more skill and there's finesse to the game. And the men, it's so fast paced and brutal. It's like you just see lots of hitting and sliding and it doesn't seem as much finesse in my opinion. So I just feel like it is more interesting to watch the women's soccer or football. Mm -hmm. So do you have a favorite? Oh, you go in the, in the uh, couple of months ago at the start of the year, I I saw an ad for it somewhere online and learned that there was a sort of a semi pro uh, league uh, here in the U S and there's a team here in Columbus, Ohio. So I was getting ready and planned to, Watch some of those games. It's where M uh, teacher. It's out where M uh, works uh, at the library. It's a, they play at that college, and then um, yeah, then everybody got sick. Yeah, hopefully it'll come back. Things are yeah starting again. I think athletics yep. they really want to, which there's probably financial reasons for that to bring it back in. But even the National Women's Soccer League, they're going to have the Championship Cup. I right. think it's called late June through and apparently they're all living in the same village. And someone just told me that one of them has contracted COVID. And I thought, gosh, this is like a Petri dish. So if any others happen, I feel like they're going to cancel it, which hopefully they don't, but yeah. And, and I think you and I were talking about this via Facebook that women's 
soccer in general has been hitting its stride and trying to get that equality and getting more viewership, especially because of World Cup. And then to have this happen was really unfortunate because it's like, oh, up, up, up. And then bam, now you've got to pause and you've got to step back and then start. I don't know where they're going to start there. Yeah, Yeah, especially on, on the women's side, it's a game that from a financial standpoint, you need to have people in the stands. <laughs> yeah. Just because the, the the pie chart of the revenue that comes in from broadcast rights versus in versus the the in-game experience mm-hmm. is, is is much more tilted towards the towards the fans coming in the gate as opposed yeah. to some of the other major sports that can survive just on the TV money. You know, mm-hmm. the gate the gate is sort of the 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 bonus, the bonus money, but you live off the TV. Yeah. And so not having fans there is a hassle and mm-hmm. inconvenience, but for some of the other sports, it's, it's lifeblood. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they live off the gate and if you can't have fans, you can't, you can't have the game. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll be keeping posted and see what happens in the next. Yeah. Especially next week or so. when all the, when the college thing happens, well, I'll transition us now to uh, a new segment and it is in tribute to shag and it is the find your joy segment, which is, called Shag's Mac and Cheese of Comfort and Joy. And so this is the time, you know, we've been talking, especially now, all this bad stuff that's been going on and COVID was really getting people down. So I thought instead of constantly talking about that, which is still good to keep in mind current events, what are some things that you have been doing or you found that, oh my gosh, that you've, (laughs) that's probably going to happen so much people, so get used to it. But what have you found or been doing to keep your spirits up in these times that we're living in currently uh well we've talked about some of this on recent episodes of both short box showcase and darkness to light and you of course as a faithful listener (laughs) of all my shows understand that but um the i'm a huge fan of the hoopla digital app that runs through uh, public libraries and they were very generous during this lockdown era of allowing for extra borrows mm. uh, because folks weren't physically getting uh, getting to the libraries. And so I did a lot of revisiting, which I, I tend to not be a rereader or rewatcher of many things. That really is M's. Uh, M, M finds comfort and joy in, in rewatching, rewatching things that, that, that they know they're going to like. Uh, for me, the list of possible things is, is so long. Um, that uh, you know, backtracking is generally not something that I do, but I needed some comfort and joy in addition to literally baking a couple uh, sheets of mac and cheese during this time. But in addition to that, uh, I, need, I needed some revisiting. So I listened to uh, some of the audiobook versions of Sherlock Holmes books and a couple of Winnie the Pooh books. I'm not afraid to admit that. Yeah, I'm, I won't be afraid to admit the following two things that are new that I have found. So as you are, yeah, yeah, as you are aware, <laughs> I mean, I should just ignore him like a puppy that won't go away. <laughs> so then, you know, maybe he'll stop, but who knows. Uh, on YouTube, you know, there's the requisite five seconds of an ad you have to watch before you can click to skip it. And so I don't know what video is looking for, but five seconds of this romance film popped up. And it looks so intriguingly bad that I ended up watching the rest of the two-minute trailers called Gabriel's Inferno on this streaming site called Passion Flicks. And so Passion Flicks, if you just say it to somebody off the street, they probably they probably will think it's a porn site. I promise you it's not. This is actually – this website is owned, operated. All of the original films are directed by the sister of Elon Musk, Tosca Musk. And so Donovan had come to visit, which I should also say that was a a nice little thing for uh, mac and cheese there was Donovan visiting. And I had shown him that trailer and he said, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. And so we decided to watch it. I ended up getting the one month subscription, $5.99. I thought I can watch all of their originals. And so some of them are just bad, bad. Some of them are bad, but with great, amazing dialogue that no one in the real world would actually say in sort of situations. And there are a couple that were actually pretty good. But I I mean, it's like a mature Hallmark channel, but that has actually brought me some joy and some laughs at night. No offense to anyone who 
Google officially, you know, who really, really likes it. Uh, what they do is I guess they get popular romance novels and turn them into movies. None of the romance novels I've ever heard of. And I've read my fair share, but they're not picking. I'm up smelling a required reading <laughs> crossover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could you imagine? Um, yeah. I just, my authors, you know, like Susan Wiggs is that she's not on there, but anyways, the other thing is, my mom and dad, I also, I would say, they've been watching like these criminal shows. Mom's been invested in World War II and documentaries on Hitler. And then they're all uh, weird other stuff. And so each time I talk to her, I'm like, you need to watch something that's light and fluffy. And sure enough, I found something. And so on Netflix, we both watched Shaun the Sheep in Farmageddon. And I'm a huge fan of Shaun the Sheep. And it was an amazing movie. And actually, in that movie, there's a Doctor Who reference. Who's it's what's it's yeah. And I actually took a video and showed it to Shag. And I thought, aren't you pr- proud, Shag, that I recognized a Doctor Who reference? But that was, that was a lot of fun. And uh, I recommend that as well. Yeah, Doctor Who is, is probably my second favorite Doctor. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, time. there you go. His Doctor in, in Doom the, shirt. In, in, in the Doctor rankings. In the Doctor. Who is, is on the list? Is Victor, does he have a PhD or is he a medical doctor? I forgot. Look. Oh, here we go. At a, at a ceremony, uh-huh. Provost Victor Von Doom uh-huh. a, from Doomstot U awarded student Victor Von Doom an honorary doctorate which is fine uh-huh. and at a ceremony uh where uh valedictorian victor von doom uh gave a, a an, an amazing speech as well by the way so it's all on the up and up <laughs> okay. in case in case you are in case yeah. in case you are questioning that uh, as any person with stockholm syndrome would would say about their mentor oh my gosh this is insane uh i want to say that at first i think this guy was actually nervous about having a video but he's just leaning into it as you can tell uh okay so we're good we're finding our joy so yeah now we're going to switch this is weird but i kind of wanted to balance out how this episode was with the first part and the second part so we're actually going to do anime watch list which Alan said that he had something. Alan, do you want to go first with yours? Or do you want me to go first? I have a manga, manga watch reading list. list. Okay, so that's, that does works. that count? Does yeah. that count? Okay, because I have a. Uh, this is by Yuma Ando and Yuki Sato. It is one of my favorite takes or versions of one of my favorite fictional characters of all time, Sherlock Holmes. Ooh. And this is. Sherlock Bones. Oh. We've got high school kid, uh, Takeru Wajimi. <laughs> and during the time of the series, he graduates. and uh, But he is the reincarnation of Dr. John Watson. At least that's what his dog believes. Because the dog, at least when the dog is uh, has the pipe in his mouth. So that's the key. When the yep. dog has the pipe in his mouth... He is the reincarnation oh. of the first world's greatest detective. Sorry, Batman, Sherlock Holmes. And when he is in Holmes mode, he can, of course, communicate with uh, Takaru. And Takaru comes from a police family. So his ability to solve crimes is highly prized, although they really don't understand how he does it. Because uh, he's just a kid. And, of course, they want him to butt out of their cases. And uh, hijinks ensue. And as far as I know, the series has... Seven volumes, at least that I know of. I'm on volume six and thoroughly enjoying it. You can see I got it from the library. Got them from, from the, the library. library from the library during uh, curbside pickup. They haven't made an anime of, version of this because this seems like it would be popular. Like it would transition well into anime form. Uh, they 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 probably have. I, I don't. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll look it up, but that sounds interesting. Also, with reincarnation, which actually is. Uh, we're to, I told a priest friend told me that we're allowed to have one heresy, and my her- <laughs> my heresy is that I like reincarnation and and wish that it were true, but just so I could be reincarnated into a moose. But I feel like usually that would be going down in your reincarnation form from human to animal. That's kind think? of spe- That's kind of speciesist. I don't think Yikes. I can continue this. Okay, well, I don't want to be canceled. So I'm I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, I'm just thinking, I just watched The Art of Racing in the Rain, which is a great book mm-hmm. that I have read. And the entire time, the dog is like, I'm excited to be, to come back as a human. And so that for him, for Enzo, it was like going up. So I just, maybe Sherlock, because didn't Sherlock have a drug problem? So maybe he's... Technicalities. Yes. <laughs> Technicalities? No, yes, he did. Okay, well, anyway, I mean, maybe he's just paying for it. But no, that actually sounds really interesting. Did you have trouble starting to read it? Because sometimes I really have to, like, the first one is a stutter stop because, you know, going backwards, basically. Well, backwards for us. Going in a different direction. How about that? And, just- and, and not just in the book. I kind of figured that out. But the page. Going through the page yeah. right to left. That was the struggle. And yeah. you do that, you know, 300 times. Yeah. But you, you'd think by the end you'd get pretty good at it. Yeah. But that was the trying to trying yeah. to put that together. I agree. And then, because I had read a series and there were like nine volumes. And then the first comic, U.S. comic that I read, I started reading it like a manga. So it's it's retraining your brain, just retraining your brain. So, so I do have some anime watch list recommendations and I had them last episode but I was getting really nervous with zoom and so I thought I just need to race through my literature recommendations and then this show will be done so I'm going to do it here so they're both films that I recommend and they're both both on Netflix so I'm sorry so you you said by rushing through the episode last time that kept it to under seven and a half hours or (laughs) yeah that's exactly what I just said thank you Thank you for perverting my words. Uh, so film number one is Violet Evergarden, Side Story, Eternity, and the Auto Memory Doll at 2019, an hour and 31 minutes. Isabella, the daughter of the noble York family, is enrolled in an all-girls academy to be groomed into a dame worthy of nobility. However, she has given up on her future, seeing the prestigious school as nothing more than a prison from the outside world. Her family notices her struggle in her lessons and decides to hire Violet Evergarden to personally tutor her under the guise of a handmaiden. At first, Isabella treats Violet coldly. Violet seems to be able to do everything perfectly, leading Isabella to assume that she was born with a silver spoon. After some time together, Isabella begins to realize that Violet has had her own struggles and starts to open up to her. Isabel soon reveals that she has lost contact with her beloved younger sister, Taylor Bartlett, whom she yearns to see again. Having experienced the power of words through her p- past clientele, Violet asks if Isabella wishes to write a letter to Taylor. Will Violet be able to help Isabel convey her feelings to her long-lost sister? And yeah, so Isabel also had some experience with the war just in a different fashion. So I recommend that. And then Nino Cooney, 2019, again uh, an hour and 46 minutes and there's a subtle connection to the video games but it is it's a different story than than that but same art style you know very uh studio ghibli High schooler Yu and his friend Haru get involved in a case involving his childhood friend Katona, which forces them to go back and forth between another world that is different but is somewhat similar to their world, Nino Kuni. When Katona's life is in danger, what's the ultimate choice the three of them have to make in Nino Kuni? And yeah, this was great fun, and you don't have to have played the video games to have to enjoy this. I've only played the second one personally. That was my first JRPG, which I was very nervous about. So both of those, very beautiful. And of course, I will always recommend Violet Evergarden, period, on Netflix as well. I've, okay. I've, I've, I've heard good things about Violet Evergarden. Oh, so good. Yeah, I have a, there's a top episode that I have where Violet spends time with a mother and there's a little daughter there and the daughter wants to play with her mom all the time and you don't know until the end what's actually going on. It's so beautiful and tragic. It's, yeah, it's great. So I recommend that for sure. Oh, boy. Well, now we're getting into part of the main course of this podcast. So we're going to talk Officer Down. And what we're going to do is Alan's going to do the recaps. Thank you for that, Alan. And as we go, we'll talk about the covers. We'll do recaps, covers as we talk about the issue. Well, okay. So let me start this over. So, for example, Alan will recap part one. Right before he starts his recap, he'll talk about the cover, which I'll, I'll also add in and engage in. Then he'll go to part two. So that's what we're going to do. So just recaps, and then we'll take our break, and then we'll come back and actually have a sizable review of this. I think that's the best way to, to split up this particular episode. So 
hopefully my computer doesn't bust as I open up all these uh, these covers and everything. But you are good to go, sir. You're you're the pilot now. Uh, <laughs> I was not informed of this. Uh, okay. Could you imagine? What if I did that to somebody? Um, one that would be really funny. <laughs> Two, make it Tom. Make it Tom. Make it Tom. Make it. Tom, I don't. Make it Tom. Oh man, I I want to keep Tom as a friend. I think he'd be really upset if I did that to him. By yeah. the way, you know That's you're doing your the recaps. Oh man. Plus, he writes all his recaps out by hand, so he'd be really upset. Troublemaker. <laughs> uh, so we've got uh, Batman five eighty seven. This is uh, the the cover is shows uh, Jim Gordon gun smoking. Yep. Down. Is, is he falling or is he? He's down on the ground. It, it does not look good for him. And we are told officer down. Yep. And I will say that all of the covers have a similar art style. Yes. The palette of colors is rather similar and just almost film noir-ish, mm-hmm. uh, but with color rather than black and white. And so I actually really love this entire this entire series. Yeah, it looks like he's in the process of falling. There's blood behind him, a spatter, mm-hmm. so you know something's happening. And then down the aisle, there's some sort of action going on, which could be the, is it called the flash point? Mm-hmm. Flash bang, I don't know, of a gun. Mm-hmm. So you kind of get a sense of what's happening with, with Jim here. And uh, this uh, 587, These Are Your Rights by Greg Recca, Rick, Rich Burchett, and Rodney Ramos. The GCBD, oh, and uh, in the interest of full disclosure, the DC, <laughs> the DC Wikia was strongly, heavily used as the jumping off point for these summaries. I just improved them greatly. The, use them all the time. The, uh, I miss comic book DB. Anyway, just throwing <laughs> that out to you. But... The GCPD throws Commissioner Gordon a birthday party, but he has also bought gifts for them, handcuff keys. And he explains why, in addition to being something you can never find when you need them. The handcuff key is a symbol of what makes police officers unique. They're the only people who have the power to remove someone's freedom. And while it's a necessary task, it's also a weighty one. Every person they take away is somebody's child, husband, brother. The awesomeness of their responsibility is easy to forget, but has to be remembered. All the while, Batman is using his police radio much more than normal to patrol, which is kind of his birthday present to his old friend. Gordon wraps up his speech, having promised Barbara he would be home early. In the alley outside, Gordon meets Catwoman. Several shots ring out, and a confused Gordon hits the ground. Three bullets in his back. The end. May he rest in peace. Then we go to Robin, 86, and like you said, similar uh, style uh, for the cover. In this one, we do have Catwoman crouched down uh, over the body of Jim Gordon. And as you said, there is a lot of blood. This is behind the lines. Ed Brubaker, Jacob Pander, and Arnold Pander, Barbara Gordon has heard the news of her father shooting over the police radio, but must pretend she is unaware of it until the department comes officially to give her the word. While the police attempt to corner Catwoman, Catwoman witnesses the real culprit, who's not Catwoman, hiding (laughs) the weapon. Barbara and Montoya comfort each other at the hospital, and acting Commissioner Aikens attempts to summon Batman. And investigating, it does not take Gotham's finest long to realize that Catwoman probably is not the one who shot the commissioner. Gotham's costume protectors answer Oracle's call and learn what happened, but Batman already knew, and he takes it particularly hard. Barbara summons the rest of the family, and Dick Grayson gets there just in time to comfort her, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Dick, now Dick was with Batman earlier, and he reports that, uh, that the old man went berserk after hearing the news, tried to kill the robbers they were stopping, and when Nightwing tried talking sense into him, Batman punched him in the face. Long overdue. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we, we, joke. we joke. Robin, Nightwing, Batgirl, and Azrael are at the hospital with Barbara, uh, but she's missing Batman. However, when Batgirl points at James Gordon's room, where he was resting after a long operation, she turns around and finds the Dark Knight standing next to her father. Because not only can he disappear, whoosh, he can up here. 
Then we get the unofficial tie-in, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We get uh, Batgirl 12, mm -hmm. which takes place at the same time. It does have an Officer Down logo across the top of the cover, but it is done in a more traditional comic style. Yeah. So it's so, sort of a fit and a misfit. Yeah. Yeah. So the cover itself doesn't have what I was just talking about, but you have Batgirl on a ledge and kind of Times Square location-esque where you've got on one of those big screens a picture of Jim and then underneath it, it says Gordon shot on the ribbon. Now this does take place as at the same time as Robin 86. So that, that's sort of a, that's sort of a tie in. This is Chuck Dixon, Dale Eagle Sham and Andrew Hennessy. Cass Kane hears the news that commissioner Gordon has been shot. She knows that Batman is his friend and Oracle is his daughter. So she sets out to help search for the gunman at police HQ. She overhears that Catwoman is a suspect. So decides to track her down visiting each of her known locations. And the, the last one does end up being uh, Catwoman's apartment, uh, but she's not home. Batgirl's presence activates a trap, but she evades the net, the bear pit, and the tranquilizing darts, because <laughs> this is a heck of a trap, in case it wasn't clear, only to find herself under attack from Sly Fox and his gang there to settle a score with Catwoman. Batgirl fights them off, trapping Sly Fox in the bear pit with a broken leg, because, you know, that's how Gotham apartments roll. They have bear pits. Yep. So, you know, some places have like a sunken living room or <laughs> like a you know, jacuzzi tub, but some have bear pits, evidently. She sets out to find the others to help them so justice can be done. Then we get Birds of Prey 27. <gasps> what did I mess up? No, no. Well, because Birds of Prey, that's like, oh, I that's, know. you know, why yeah. I'm recapping these things. Yeah, do Then it. we get Birds of Prey uh, 27 in the cover here. We've got, uh, I guess, sort of the, the chalk outline. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, Christmas Allen and, and Montoya and Bullock sort of staring down. But again, it has that. We're, we're back to that that common uh, uh, theme and, and cover style. Mm -hmm. This is Armed and Dangerous. Chuck Dixon and Stephen Harris and John Nyberg. At James Gordon's hospital room, Batwoman orders his associates to track down Catwoman, their only lead so far. Even Barbara is ordered to leave while Batman remains behind, a circumstance that both Barbara and Alfred criticize him for. We have the, uh, the, the GCPD squad is pretty unimpressed with the guy leading up the investigation and the new acting commissioner. Uh, but the offers looking into this get no leads whatsoever from potential eyewitnesses. No one in the area saw or heard a thing, evidently. Batgirl, Nightwing, Azriel, and Robin seek out Catwoman's known associates and take a more enhanced, aggressive approach to gather information. And they learn that Catwoman probably has her eyes set on some valuable emeralds. They spot a woman infiltrating the museum, but they discover that it is, in fact, not Catwoman, but her buddy Harley Quinn. Harley extracts a promise that they will not hurt her friend Catwoman in exchange for revealing her whereabouts. The heroes rush off, but not before Batgirl delivers what we call a consequence, a punishing blow to Harley, because Harley forgot to include herself in the promise that they wouldn't hurt Catwoman. <laughs> Which leads us to Catwoman. Catwoman 90. And here we've got some members of the, the Bat family, basically in that same location where the officers were last issue with the, uh, I'm guessing, with the chalk outline there. Yeah. And it's, and it's raining. It is raining, which I do want to get to talk about that with the back roll issue, because I thought that was a bit odd. But what I like about this is that you've got the four members in kind of a standard group pose and looking down, obviously, it's a solemn scene. But behind them or underneath them in, in terms of Azrael, you've got their shadows in action, which mm -hmm. sort of points to what nice. they do within the actual issue. This is Smoking Gun by Bronwyn Carlton, Mike Lilly, and Wayne Faucher. Despite uh, being injured, Catwoman desperately races across the Gotham rooftops to escape the various costumed vigilantes who are pursuing her in connection with the shooting. She is gradually worn down and eventually captured by members of the Batman family, having been guided by Oracle. She reveals 
that she saw Gordon's attacker. And although she wouldn't be able to identify the specific person, it was definitely a cop. She's even able to give them the location of the gun used to shoot the commissioner, which she saw the cop in question hide. And then she went back and hide it and hide it in a different hidey place. <laughs> so following her instructions, they found it. And the heroes let Catwoman go, vowing to trace the weapon. And meanwhile, doctors perform some surgeries on the commissioner. Which takes us to Nightwing 53. And here we've got uh, Nightwing doing his, you know, acrobat, you know, on the uh, you know, sort of telephone wires or something uh, stretching across the uh, a couple of buildings. And he is uh, uh, looking down on, on a scene. On a scene with his girlfriend? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that redhead there? Who's that redhead there? <laughs> So, I mean, it's a little creepy, a little stalkery, but, uh, you know, what a, I, you <laughs> interpret it however you want to. <sighs> Nightwing brings Barbara the gun. Oh, wait, did I say? This is, oh, I, I see why I wanted to skip the title, because it's called Inculpatory. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I don't know. It's, it sounds like a legal thing. Oh, my. That is by Devin Grayson, Rick Burchett, who I think I may have called Rich Burchett earlier in the episode, and Rodney Ramos. Nightwing brings Barbara the gun and search, and she searches out its source, acting on the info from Catwoman that the shooter was uh, a fellow police officer. The gun itself once belonged to the Lucky Hand Triad, part of a stash of weapons that was confiscated from them earlier in the year. One of the officers, there's, there's two, Lowell or Rich, failed to hand this particular weapon in as they should have done, perhaps planning to use it as a drop gun. Barbara knows Officer Lowell. He helped defend the clock tower during No Man's Land. But Officer Rich is a new recruit, and Oracle quickly figures out that he's actually Jordan Reynolds, a former mafia member in Chicago arrested years ago by James Gordon. Da, da, da. He turned state's evidence and was released under witness protection with a new identity and a grudge. At the hospital, Alfred is frustrated by Batman's reaction to the shooting, simply waiting at Gordon's bedside, not helping him in any way, not making any effort to catch the man who shot him. And so Alfred quits. Finally. (laughs) Uh, Wait a minute. Later, unseen by anyone, Gordon wakes for the first time since the attack. On the other side of the city, Nightwing approaches Harvey Bullock and hands him the gun, telling him all he needs to know about both the gun and the man who attempted to kill the commissioner. And then, whoa, we're winding down now. We are in yeah. the home stretch. <gasps> we have got Detective Comics 754, and we have our uh, officers in, in an outside scene, and uh, is, Harvey's looking pretty frustrated. Yeah, is in, it's interesting. This one and then the other issue that we had with Harvey, I can tell that it's Harvey mainly because of his hat. But if you didn't have that, it just seems like a more attractive version of Harvey. Because, I mean, he's pretty grizzled. Yeah. He usually yeah. has lots of stubble and he's not the slimmest. <laughs> I said stubble. You have actual hair growth. But, you know, he's not the, the uh, slimmest of police and mm-hmm. so it's interesting. You kind of, they've really That's made true. him into more of a romanticized version of Harvey, which is interesting. interesting. But yeah. This is Monster in a Box by Nunzio de Filippis, mm. Mike Collins, Steve Bird, and Jesse Delperdang. Detectives Montoya and Crispus Allen have Jordan Rich, the man they are certain is responsible for the commissioner's shooting in the box, determined to extract a confession because they know they don't have the physical evidence needed, despite having the gun. And as a cop and former criminal, he smugly avoids all the traps they lay for him, even when they threaten to bring Batman in. At the hospital, Gordon has recently woken up and can confirm Rich's identity to Lieutenant Bullock, but did not see the man who shot him. Eventually, the police have to let Rich go. Batman confronts him on the streets of Gotham, but he is powerless. He doesn't have it in him to kill the officer. Does that mean he'll never have justice? And this confrontation is witnessed by Montoya from the shadows. And then we wrap it all up with Batman, Gotham Knights number 13. And here we have Batman 
for the first time on a cover. He is in the streets. He is he is uh, uh, in the streets. In a, <laughs> in, he is in an alleyway, and, and he doesn't look happy. He doesn't look happy, yeah. And it seems like it's daylight out, which is also uncommon for Batman to be out. But, yeah, you have the commish with a cane in the mm-hmm. background looking towards Batman, and then Batman has either a dismissive hand, a left, hand up or saying goodbye but not looking at him which of course speaks to what happens in the actual issue and in case we didn't make it clear this one is called the end (laughs) just just so you know this is by greg rucka again rick burchett and rodney ramos two weeks have passed since gordon was shot by jordan reynolds a man whose life was destroyed after gordon arrested him many years ago the commissioner's out of the hospital walking with the use of his cane and has made a very difficult decision, it is time to retire. So he addresses the major crimes unit personally to explain that and to say goodbye. They do not take it well, particularly Bullock and maybe even more so Montoya. She blames herself for the inability to prove that Reynolds was the man that shot Gordon. Gordon introduces the new commissioner, Michael Akins, to the Batman, but that meeting, a little bit awkward. It does not go well. It's not go well. For one, Batman is angry that his old friend did not speak to him about it first. Although Gordon does point out, it's not very easy to contact Batman. Montoya calls in sick and Bullock suspects he knows where she's gone to Rich's apartment to make him pay for what he did to the commissioner. He stops her from shooting the man, but threatens him himself and then leaves. Gordon and Batman have a more reasonable talk where the Dark Knight is persuaded to give Akins a chance. Still later, Jordan Rich's apartment stands empty. A blood stain on the floor. The end. (laughs) And what an end that is. Thank you so much for doing all of the recaps. I think I'll give you an AA+. Yes! Yes! So that's it. Yeah. So some gold stars are on the way for <laughs> your, uh, your. Do wife. I get to do a teacher evaluation of you? Of me? Yeah, I can send you a survey okay, at the that end. Would be, that would be great. Thank you. But uh, yes, Mrs. Quarterbin can pin up your gold stars on the refrigerator once yes. I send them to her. So. <laughs> Okay, people. So normally we would review right now, but we're actually going to take a break just because I Zoom. I want to be sure that this is okay. And and I think splitting up these videos anyways into bite-sized chunks worked in in the past. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be giving our thoughts in depth review on Officer Down. But first it is Zias's Radio Hour featuring Be Kind by Marshmallow and Halsey. Maybe they wrote that for... um, (laughs) for Batman specifically. (laughs) Okay, see you guys soon.
Okay, we are back. We took our little break. And in the meantime, you didn't get to see it, but I got to talk with uh, Mrs. Quarterbin, which was a delight. And a we- vast improvement. <laughs> <laughs> to the, the male quarterman, yeah. Uh, and, you know, she and I might gang up on this guy and beat him up. Who knows? So just don't go walking down a dark alley with me or I'll get you. I'll get you. Okay. You know, there is one story. I felt really bad that one day that I, ca- I came to church with you and I had to leave where I was early to make it. And your wife asked about coffee and I felt like I was short with her. I was like, I don't drink coffee because I was, you know, tired and everything. And then I felt bad. Like, I, I didn't mean to be that rude. But I think it was she understood and you also put it her up to it. I, I, I have no recollection, no idea yeah. what you're, what are you even there? I don't, I, I don't remember. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Whew. Okay. So we are going to talk, oh my gosh, we're going to talk officer down now. We're going to review it. And so how I have it laid out is I've got certain talking points per issue Mm -hmm. and then overall talking points, which of course our number one overall talking point has to be what? Because you're on here. What are we going to talk about for sure? Since you're on here. Uh, The price. No. (laughs) The, the, the quarter what pin price. do I always say? And then I mention your name. I say, hair. Oh, yes, there we go. We will be talking about Barbara Gordon's hair. Okay. So what do you yeah. think her hair's like here during, um, during quarantine? I mean, oh, are the, ro- are the roots coming out? I mean, is roots? it natural color? I mean, is there some enhancement? To, are you to the- saying that no, she I'm does just it, saying, she's not a natural redhead? I'm just saying it might. I'm saying in some, it's a little more red sometimes, a little more orange sometimes. Oh, is yeah. there is there a little bit? And then how does it look now? Is it <laughs> yeah. extra long? Is it naturally curly? These are the, I'm here for this, this reason. It's a good question. And then someone tagged me on Twitter recently. I don't know who it was, so forgive me. And they sent me an image and the coloring was purple, black-esque. Like that was just the type of coloring that they yeah. did. Um, and so, yeah, she's got all sorts of styles. I feel like in quarantine, she's grown it out. It's probably longer than shoulder length now. And then the bangs would probably be the greatest uh. change. Like maybe she can actually like sweep them away. She wouldn't have bangs. <laughs> Or 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 is she trimming those during the quarantine? Like some, you, know, you, could. you could do that at home. That's well, true. From what I hear, well, from what I hear, yeah, he doesn't take that sort of advice. Okay, there were some fun details that I found on this one. Uh, for instance, as Batman was listening to all of the different activities that were going on. I noticed that one of them said that there were three naked GSU students in Robinson Park. <laughs> and my immediately my immediate thought was, isn't Poison Ivy still in Robinson <laughs> Park? <laughs> That's a good point. And shouldn't you, yeah, actually uh maybe not be there. But the bulk of what I would like to talk about, which is funny because it's this first issue, is actually mm-hmm. his speech about the the handcuffs and the right. keys that he gives them. And I actually, I was going to put this on Goodreads that I was reading this. And this is why I have Goodreads because sometimes I forget that I read something and I was going to put want to read, but it said it, you read it in 2017. So I thought, okay, I'm glad I remember. But yeah, when this came up, I was like, wow, this is pretty relevant to now. And and I thought it'd be good to potentially discuss this. So he says, I mean, it's his retirement party or not. It's his birthday party. Sorry. It's his birthday party. People are giving him gifts. And then he does something that most people don't do, which he gives them a gift. And it is, in fact, the key because everyone loses theirs, I think it is. So they can, he says, what's the one piece of equipment you can never find when you need it? And everyone says handcuff keys. And then, but that's not the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, this key represents your power more than the badge, more than the gun. The handcuff is the symbol of our authority. And then someone asks, explain, please. Uh, Sorry, I have to go through There's Batman stuff in between. I'm talking about the source of our power. When all is said and done, we, the police, have really only one power. One guy says, the law. Sure, not the law, Detective Burke. Uh, I'm talking about the power of arrest. 
We are the only people in this free nation who have the power to deprive a citizen of their freedom, of their liberty. The only people with the authority to hold another against their will. And then Christmas Allen says the theft of freedom. Not theft, Crispus, but rather removal. And yes, when you think about it, that's an awesome responsibility. Uh, Not talking about some street perp. I'm talking about arresting some guy in front of his friends and the like. That's the moment you realize the power. Uh, And then I guess he talks about something that happened before, which I guess actually is this is the connection to uh, the guy he's talking about, isn't it? Because he says, oh, long ago when I was young, I'm talking when I was on the job in Chicago, I wasn't even a lieutenant yet working on this lead I had in the Vittoni family. A uh, long story short, got mm-hmm. a lead. The guy running numbers in the loop worked him for a couple months building a case. He was a scale, sold dope on the side, ran around on his wife. Not a nice guy. Bullock says, sounds like he got what was owed him. Jim says he did. He deserved to go down, no question. But he had a family, wife, kid. They were crying when I put the cuffs on. So that, that's actually, I'm glad I'm rereading this because there it was. There's mm-hmm. our guy that we didn't really know. Lit laying uh, the groundwork. Yep. It wasn't the first family I broke up, but it changed how I saw the job. Uh, and I feel like that. Uh, and so he says, if we forget that, basically, that there are families involved, that we forget that at our peril. And I could go on, but I think that gives a sense of that whole mm-hmm. speech, which I feel like, I mean, to spoil, I guess, my thoughts on that. I felt like it was a really well-written speech. Do you have thoughts on what he's saying and, and how it was set up. I, mean, I think that in in general, I, I think I think all of I think the the main core of these writers, Greg Rucka and Ed Brubaker and Chuck Dixon. This is a Rucka uh, Rucka script, but I think they really know this stuff well, both from the construction of the crime in the the police detail, and then I think also being able to give that sort of balanced portrayal of what a you know the the duties and responsibilities of a, of a individual, you know, a a police officer. One of the, uh, one of the classes I teach is government and business. And one of the early topics we talk about is sort of the, the power dynamics between businesses and, 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 and government. And see sort of what, what's more scary, a corrupt business or a corrupt government and sort of no matter how big or, and, and, scary a a business might be they actually can't deprive you of your freedom but the sheriff's deputy hired one day before in the smallest town in the middle of somewhere with seven residents can take away your freedom you know uh, 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 everything that government does eventually comes down to with the with the force of with the force of a gun yeah through uh through law enforcement Mm -hmm. and it's the more laws you have the more enforcement you have to have you know, yeah. those things, those things uh, run together and that, and, and the power of even the lowest, uh, you know, lowest down on the totem pole, a police officer, a uh, law enforcement uh, officer has a lot of power. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel, you know, we're really focused, especially in these current times. I, I think that this, this story resonates, especially this speech that Jim gives. And you do think about the violence that they, the potential violence that they have because of the the gun as a symbol of that. But to look at this handcuff that seems more or less innocuous and show that actually look at how much power this object has, mm-hmm. I thought was really interesting and, and, uh, uh, a great way to go about talking about that, and I, love- I mean, we use that we we use that phrase more for prison, but lock them up and throw away the key. Yeah, but you know, certainly the the metaphor absolutely applies with handcuffs. As yeah, well. and it's a bit. I feel like there might be some symbols there that you know, every people lose that key. <laughs> So just like, what does that mean yeah. for the person who's actually in handcuffs? You've <laughs> lost it. Does that mean that I, I no longer have that ability to even be freed from this? Mm-hmm. And then I love that Jim and then, of course, the, the writers talk about that each of these people, no matter what type of scumbag they were, because that's certainly how he portrayed that guy, they are mm-hmm. somebody to someone else or there's some sort of connection, you know, a son or a brother. And that's, I think, what we forget about. We only see the crime. We don't necessarily see the people. So I felt like this was a great speech and a a great way to start off this particular story. Agreed. Uh, And I'll also say, because you were talking about Greg Rucka, that I love... Gotham uh, Central. Yes, thank you. Which is him and, and Brubaker, right? This is yes. both of them. So and I mean so, this is to some extent this is the tryout book. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. This is the, the proof of concept. 
Yeah, and, and it works. And yeah, we can save that discussion, I think, for our overall. Yeah. But like this is, you're getting a, a sense for what that is. Yeah, thoughts thoughts on this particular issue? That was the main discussion point I wanted for this one. But what do you think I, about this I, one? I guess one, there's one sort of um, more meta comic thing. And it really doesn't have the effect in, in, in this case as much because it's called Officer Down. That's that's what the story, that's what the story is. But I've recently be, become passionate about covers that give away not just what happens in a comic, but the literal last page of the comic. Mm. And obviously in this case, you're starting a long story arc. It's a little bit different, but but we do have the cover of Gordon being shot um, is what the cover is. And that happens on you know, literally the last, that's also the last image of the book. So generally speaking, that would annoy me, but I certainly give this one a pass because that's the point. Yeah. That's it's the jumping off point. Yeah. It's it's not it's not a spoiler. You're you're being set up for that. So do you prefer to have covers that focus on another detail in the story or do you want covers that don't necessarily have anything to do with the story? Uh you can go either way, but um I mean, for this one, I mean, theoretically, you, you you could have used that same art style. I mean, none of the other covers really reveal like a twist. Yeah. They they um, give you a sense of what's going to happen in the story, sense of who the characters are, sense of what's going to happen, a tease uh, more. Uh, and they certainly all are are poster worthy type of images. Again, I'm not crit- criticizing this 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 cover in in particular for what it's doing. Again. Officer Down is yeah. the name of the story. That yep. that concept is 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 all throughout it. Just it just poked at me just a little bit. Oh, I've, yeah. been, I've been <laughs> ranting about this uh, recently elsewhere. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll have to listen to that. Are you doing an episode on that? <laughs> you you'd listen? Yeah. Really? Is it, yeah. Do you pro- uh, is that a promise? Is well, that a promise? Yeah, as long as you send the episode, like the number and everything to me when I log on to iTunes next. <sighs> so the backstory with this, and then I'll get back to why I'm asking you about the comics of the covers and everything, is that I don't listen to other people's podcasts. And it's not because I'm trying to disrespect them or I don't care for them. It's just like, well, number one, I've been read, listening to more audiobooks when I've been doing stuff. And the only podcast, oh gosh, he's crying. I'm so sorry. There, there, Doom will be with you. Doom is eternal. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the only one is Who's Who, and I haven't listened to that for months. I haven't gone on to iTunes or anything. So that's that's the only reason. So unless someone like specifically says you should listen to this one episode, then it's just hard for me. I just don't have my my iPod. But back to the the co- I would like to hear your reasons. The reason why I was asking is I that's the opposite of what I feel. Now I don't necessarily want the last story point to be revealed. Of course, we knew Officer Down going in that something was going to happen. But I really liked in the Bronze and Silver Age where the covers were literally like a pull from from inside the story or that it talks about the story because the ones that I haven't liked were covers that had absolutely nothing to do or was like a reverse or not a reverse um they were trying to trick you or i don't know there's just yeah. something on there well, that's like, that a, doesn't there, even happen yeah, yeah so those there's are the spec there's a spectrum there is there. yeah so i'd like to hear your uh, yeah, your thoughts the, on that and yeah, maybe the, i'll write in too who uh, know i mean this is big <laughs> the, the 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 basic point was um that the later in the issue the later in the story what you're putting on the cover is yeah. The worse it is. Okay. I see. Yeah. yeah. So I'll like have this to, is yeah. supposed to, like if, 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 if the last couple of pages are intended to be a dramatic reveal. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's, yeah. I mean, it's basically a spo- spoiler right yeah. there on the cover. Yeah. Spoiler, I should have said. <gasps> spoiler. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to part two and we can talk about, uh, we'll talk about both Robin and Batgirl, but we can, we can split them apart. And so I first want to see what you thought about the art of Robin. I did not make any specific notes about it. Okay. Uh, so is, is, that, is that a good sign or a bad sign? I don't, I don't know. know. I, it was of all of them, and they were different. Obviously, they were different books, yeah. so they had different styles. But I liked this the least. Uh, so I just wondered if that was me or well, not. I'm not. I'm not familiar with these artists Yeah. terribly well. It's, uh, I don't know. They just seem almost 
Picassian? Is that Picassoian? I don't know how you would say it. But I'm just on what page two, and I think that's Montoya. Like just her face is really, really thin and long. I don't know. And and I have to look at Babs too. Obviously, I, I like to look at how Babs is portrayed because I just feel like I. Oh yeah, know this is kind of this is very angular, very <laughs> yeah. strange. Everything's a little exaggerated. Yeah. Is that Harvey? Is that Harvey? Is mouth? Yeah, it's very strange. You're so, right. So you're right. I, I just so of all of them. I mean, Catwoman yeah. looks really evil, which we'll we'll talk about that. That could be potentially uh, purposeful. Um, but yeah, I just liked this one the least. I, I felt it was unattractive, which I don't like to say because I mean these are artists, uh-huh. and you know I still re- I respect the hard job, but this was just not the art style for me. What do you think of Bab's hair? Bab's hair, yeah. So it's pulled a lot back, of brown. Which, There's a lot of brown mixed in with the red. Um, not yeah. sure about that. I'm just shorter, I'm just saying, and it's yeah. got the uh, headband, which we've mm-hmm. seen before in Nightwing. So that kind of tracks with Nightwing, but it's not consistent with other issues that we've got in this. Right, and and then consistent within what we, else we've said about the about all of the characters here. It's sort of very sharp, yeah, and and angular. But yeah. again, that's not that's not unique to the Barbara in this case. Absolutely. So since we're on the Barbara topic, yeah, talking about her and, oh, I, I love that scene with her and Renee and that she checks in with Renee. And and that's just, I mean, that's just like Barbara, that absolutely Barbara's going through something. This is terrible for her, but she's looking out for other people. What did you think about how Babs was portrayed in this issue? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, Babs sort of reminds me of my wife because <laughs> everywhere we go, there's someone who knows her and that person always without fail likes her. And I think Barbara's sort of the same way. Like everybody knows her and nobody has a bad thing to say about her. And here we sort of were, were, were the, you know, the fruits of being a good friend, Yeah. you know, building, uh, building relationship, building a support team, Yeah. you know, being that for other people. Mm-hmm. Now, when she's in need that you've, you've built up that social capital. Yeah. And and they run to her aid because they love her. And there's certainly, and I don't think it's this issue uh, with the Batman thing, but it's interesting the differences between how those two react. And we can get more into that. But Babs is very much someone who I think needs feels the need to be solid and a good foundation for people because other people are freaking out. Yeah. And so she needs to stay calm. And so I think that's certainly something that she sees here. And, I, and I, 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 I think within this, within the structure of the greater bat family, bat world, I think the Gordons are to some extent sort of the glue that hold the whole thing together, you know, Barbara mm-hmm. in one way and then the commish, you know, in a, in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And then the the Dick and Bab scene where she asks for him, you know, where's Dick? And then he arrives and, and goes right to her. Of course, it got to my heart, my shipper heart for those too. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Well, oh my gosh. Well, that's because you are unfeeling. Does Victor Von true. Doom have any? Oh yeah, he dated that lady with the long black hair. The Contessa? What? Is that her name? The, there is that, but obviously his. And Sue his, Storm. His one true love. Yes. So, I mean, let, let's be honest. Namors. <laughs> Let's be honest. Susan Storm Richards Von Doom. It's a pretty great name. It just oh rolls gosh. right off the tongue. Just yeah, saying. right. Anywho. Once you go Latverian, you, I don't, this, I don't know. You, <laughs> there's nothing to rhyme with that. Once you go Doom, maybe you don't. I don't know. I don't know. Though, as a side, boy, we're getting off track. I will say that if I were to want her to have an affair with anyone, which sounds really terrible, I feel like it'd be Namor. <sighs> Who are? Do I even know you? <laughs> what? I guess not. There's just Man. one scene in Civil War that my heart was filled hey, look, with I th- butterflies. I think, I think the main thing that we've learned, yeah, from Sue, you know, why are you let, getting your scarf out? Let's just say, let's just say, Sue is willing yeah. to eye the field. And I'm not saying that says anything bad about Reed yeah. Richards, but clearly that says terrible things about Reed Richards. Well, you know, this is not the, the fan. I don't know. I, it was my fault that we got off on it, but I will say that I feel like he's a neglectful husband to a certain extent. I mean, he is <laughs> certain more... extent, hundred percent extent. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't 
throw around phrases like terrible human being all that often. But when I do, I apply them to Reed Richards. Okay. So anyway, so she has that freedom. I mean, all of my love for her and respect for her comes from Civil War when she wrote that note to him and was like, I've got to get out of here because uh, I, I completely respected that. But anyways, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, he totally married up, I mean, in my opinion. But it, we're back to officer down. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I know. Take deep breaths. But now we get into this. Uh, I don't know if what your feelings are. I guess I'll get a sense of it with Batman as a jerk. But it's going to be a theme in this particular episode. So it's a good thing Donovan's not here. So just be prepared, listeners, if you roll your eyes when I do this. But here's jerk moment number one with Batman backhanding Dick and nearly choking a perp to death. I mean, do you feel like these are reasonable sp- responses? And the the obvious answer is no, but reasonable in terms of who Batman is and the circumstances surrounding why he's doing it. Does it make sense that, yes, he would act out in this or lash out in this way? He's a passionate man. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, he's, he's grieving, he's angry. So, you know, that's, that's obviously the attempt at a, at a justification. Uh, for it. But, and, and I like, she's not in this, but I like the Huntress as a mm-hmm. character. And what I like about the Huntress is that she is someone harsher than Batman. Like she is someone who Batman says, come on, reel it in. So later, Helena, reel it in a little bit. Okay. Just pr- bring it back just a little bit. So I like that there is somebody who is rougher, tougher, meaner uh, than he is. Uh, but when he has to, he can go there. Mm. And he, he's he's not he's not. I, I I like him being not the Boy Scout that Superman is. Yeah, right? I mean, they're, they're different approaches, different lifestyles, different uh, worldviews. Yeah, I feel like you know the the choking the perp close to right or or beating someone up. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've probably seen it before from other media things, but you know, Batman. I could definitely see that happening. But the one that just really gets to me is him like hauling off and hitting dick i felt like there that was uncalled for and Mm -hmm. there's not even an apology or like any sort of look of remorse just you know because dick got in the way which that that's the 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 problem that i have occasionally Mm -hmm. with batman because yeah i can totally see you know the the passion that you're talking about but you know that's his number one guy you know he's been with him and and that's what you do and and i just wonder what if it were someone else who was there what if tim were with him or Cass? like would he have done that so yeah so i mean i feel like but is that but is that the person (laughs) That you can be the most oh. unvarnished, fully released version of yourself. Yeah, that is true. And maybe yeah, would like, have he may he, he he probably would have held back for anyone else, perhaps. Yeah, you might be right. Yeah, this was that, the chance to let it out. Yeah, being com- the, I inappropriately, mean, be- inappropriately. <laughs> yes. In case yeah. that wasn't clear. No. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. That's a good argument to make. That that was him being vulnerable there, and he trusts Dick mm-hmm. to to show that vulnerable side of him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else on Robin eighty six? Thoughts on that one? Okay. So then, yeah, same time, same time of part two is of course back row number twelve. And uh, yeah, my question for this one was, where'd that rain come from? <laughs> uh, that's the only oh, thing. Oh, that's true. If it is the same time. Yeah, yeah it's Ru- the same Baker time. and Dixon were not chatting yeah. with each other or the artists or the artists uh, uh, were thinking, ooh, it's a Batman book. Probably got to be rain. We, we have to make it moody in some way. Yeah. That's that's as far as I could tell of yeah why it was. But I will say like this: I mean, in you know this this might be one one uh, one spot where this isn't the case. But overall, and I don't know these editors, Idelson and Shrek, very well. But boy, did they pull this thing together! It 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 is start to finish. I'm jumping ahead, but it is an impressive feat mm. to have done this. Didn't this come out at all in the same month? Or this came, or close to it. This yeah. came out. The, this whole storyline came out pretty quickly. Yeah. So keeping all of that in line from editorial is pretty impressive. And mm-hmm. eh, you know, if you let it slide with some rain, <clears throat> once I'm, okay? I'm, I'm willing to give him a pass. It, yeah. It's an it, it's an it's an A instead of an A plus. Gotcha. I I will note at least that the I found it fun when she enters 
the clock tower. And of course, Oracle has her security system, which is always beefy. And the recognition is Cassandra. So that's actually the first time that Cassandra herself has said that name because in the past, Barbara has called her that oh, or right. slipped mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. slipped when talking to her. Like, oh, maybe she doesn't know that yet. But yeah, so now Cass actually calls herself Cassandra. Uh, and the only other strange thing might be that... It's written as if Batgirl hasn't had any interactions with Catwoman in the past, whereas she actually did. She went on this mission with her, and then Catwoman tries to trick her, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is just written as if, you know, Catwoman's this person she had heard of, but now she's doing research. So I almost wish that there would have been Mm -hmm. some connection or, or internal, like... She didn't seem like the lethal type, that sort of thing, which uh, that was a big theme anyways, people thinking that Catwoman's not lethal. This was a, I mean, this, uh, when this storyline originally came out, I was out of comics. I was out of comics in mid to late nineties, up to about 2008, 2010, whatever. And so Cassandra Kane in general happened while I was out of comics. So Mm. I know a lot of people love her and I, I, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience reading her books yeah uh yeah a fun story but uh, it doesn't add as much in pushing forward the narrative but it's good i think to include her since of course Mm -hmm. she shows up with the bat family so to see what she was doing on the side and yeah i mean the whole thing about looking out for or finding her different hideouts and then the one that the trap and the people that come for her which is really interesting so it was action-packed it was action packed. Yeah. I guess they had to to kind of make sense of having a tie in potentially. I think we, oh, Birds of Prey. Okay. So this is the big one because once we get to Catwoman, I have some info to share. Uh, yes. Okay. Here's Bat Jerk. This is when we'll really talk about it. But do I have any questions before Bat Jerk? Oh, okay. Well, I, question. I, I, I was, I was going to ask if, uh, where during this time, Barbara got her extensions for her hair <laughs> because it seems to have grown a lot in just a couple of days. I, yeah. I know that's I'm here. I mean, see? obviously you, you can see why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. Of you look no, like that you is. On YouTube. You can see my Gosh. expertise in this area. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite, uh, it was quite a little different. I is mean, it's, yeah. I mean, we sort of joke about it, but every character has a character design. There's yeah. like a, but it, she seems to be quite varied in how it's she is portrayed. True. Maybe it's because maybe it's because you know I listen to your show faithfully. <laughs> Thank you. That I, that I uh, notice it more about her uh, than other characters, but it seems that uh, yeah, every artist decides to do their own thing. It seems like it. I mean, I just feel like Barbara Gordon pre Oracle has long hair, and then. Barbara Gordon as Oracle is more of a bob and it could be Mm, shoulder mm -hmm. length or above, but yeah, anything that's like flapper that short or here, it kind of seems, what is this here? Yeah. Oh, he's showing us. Yeah. Yeah, Cause they can't see, (laughs) but yeah. Yeah. Below her shoulder. It seems just like her. That's her uh, COVID hair right there. I'm asking. It's like, she's been in lockdown for three months and is uh, only a couple of days away from getting an illegal black market haircut or something like, I I don't know who that would be referring to, but yeah. Yeah. Um, So one of my questions is, do you think it's reasonable that uh, people suspect Catwoman for the crime? I like the first off I ship, the bat and the cat. Same. Just draw draw that right here. I also ship bat and Talia. Just don't let. Just oh don't my. tell the. Just don't tell them too. Okay. It, it might get ugly, <laughs> but. It's eighty years. Okay. I mean, you know, things. You know, with for for Batman. You know, he's been around a long time. Yeah. Um. Uh, do not, by the way, ship uh, Batman and Sue Storm. That would not. Yikes. That would not work. I'm just throwing that out. Just throwing that out for the next crossover. That would not yeah. not be. That'll be good. Uh, but in, in this era, yeah, you know, Catwoman, I I don't think she would do it. But yeah. I guess she had someone dressed up. Is that what was she's seen <laughs> yeah. sort of at the beginning? That's sort of a strange clue. We yeah. find out what actually happened. But Yes. 
Yeah. I think, you know, my knee jerk is that Catwoman's not lethal. And even some of the Bat family are saying, like, this doesn't fit her MO. But Batman is saying, you know, prison has changed her. And so it's, I guess it's his knee jerk. This came up in the previous episode of just like, there's not necessarily a trust there, which I guess I can't expect as much trust for Catwoman as I would Azrael, which was last one. But I did reach out to Josh Bertoni. Because I felt like he might know what happened because I wasn't reading Catwoman. I don't read Catwoman. So only when there are crossovers like this. And I said, what happened? Basically, do you know the circumstances of Catwoman's arrest and time in prison pre-officer down? Uh, He said he read that a few years ago. His details are fuzzy, but she was caught and refused to give her real name. So she was sentenced as a Jane Doe. Her fingerprints had been scrubbed from every system, etc. She took a plea deal thinking she could avoid jail, but her public defender or lawyer, I don't think I don't have it in front of me, uh, tricked her. So she was jailed. She escaped and was pretty mad at Gordon for it. This was shortly after No Man's Land, if I recall. It was a big deal because in post-crisis continuity, Catwoman had never been arrested before. And I asked if anything happened to her in prison because it seemed like something must have for this to uh, go on. Uh, She was very unhinged when she got out and went after Gordon with a vengeance. I don't remember anything traumatic happening in prison, but she was very violent afterwards. So just to give a sense of who this Catwoman is, because they mention at least a couple times that prison changed her. She's a different person. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I guess with that, if you've got that detail, then maybe you would be. But we as the readers have actually seen that the shots came from behind and not in front. And I did forget to say in that issue that I thought it was funny, though I don't know if it's supposed to be where... Gordon shoots and you realize he probably shot because he was startled and he had his hand on the gun and she says, you shot me. I just thought it was a funny, like, how dare you? You know, it finally happened. Okay. Are we at my bat jerk question? I have to see trying to warm up to it. No, okay. I, 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 so I, I do have one other comment here on, oh, on birds of prey before you get that. And that is that these, um, these jewels that they're worried about, that might be that the, using as a, as a as a lure uh, for Catwoman these valuable emeralds yeah. or, or whatever they are on loan from the country of real Asia. Yes. So they are real Asian. Oh, real Asian. Yeah. But I mean, come on, come up with something better than that. Yeah, I don't know. We Umek, we only have Umek, so many. Generistan. You could come up with something. <laughs> we only have so many fake DC locations to do uh yes before the bat jerk i do say they have the um i I, well you're waiting for it but i just found another one we're warming up the bat jerk question when they have each of them or she i think barbara does this has each of the bat family members go off you've got tim on his own with a bunch of goons you have Cass on her own and then you have nightwing and asriel paired up together was that odd for you i mean you send out Tim and he's got these huge goons, but no, Azrael and and Nightwing deal with an art dealer. I thought well, they can't be on their own, and I don't know. That was bizarre for me. What do you hmm. think about that? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, Oracle maybe a little off her game. <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> trust true, either. Yeah. The, no, I don't. I'm not. I'm not. Man. Okay, so here is the bat jerk question, as I'll say. So this scene, I'm on page four, I guess it is. She uh, says, you've given us our marching orders. What are you going to do? And Batman says, I'm staying right here. Barbara says, you could be a lot of help. Batman says, I trained all of you. You each have your specialties. You can coordinate this as well as I could. And she says, he's my father. Then there's silence in the next panel as she looks away, kind of like a annoyed, like her hand is, is by her eye. And then he's just looking at Jim. And then she rolls away and says, that's it then. We do your bidding and you get to wallow in grief. Maybe, maybe you'd better think about changing your specialty, Bruce. You don't handle the grieving thing so well. This actually really teed me off because, gosh, uh, I just feel like he's so selfish. I mean, it is. That's the whole, That's my father. And I can't be with him and you can't be the one to relay those. What, what did you think about this whole scene here? Uh, <laughs> wallowing in grief. Yeah. Is Batman. <laughs> this is not a revelation. <sighs> right. Wallowing in grief is Batman. Yeah. And, and Jim Gordon was one of Batman's father figures. 
before he was ever Barbara's father figure. Oh my gosh! No, I'm just that's that's the best that's the best defense I can. So I, your I can explanation is that okay that he has first rights to Jim. Batman does. Batman has a lot of associates. Wow. He has a lot of family. He has very few friends. And you have, we we have to remember the very first panel of the very first Batman story ever was Bruce Wayne and Commissioner Gordon. Hmm. That was the very first scene of any Batman comic ever. And so their relationship is literally the longest lasting relationship I see. that that uh, that the character has. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think he feels it not in the same way yeah. that, uh, that, uh, that, that Barbara does, obviously. But but he, but uh, to me, the commissioner and Alfred are are in, in different ways Bruce's uh, father figures. Yeah. So he is taking it personally. Yeah, yeah, and you know I can see that, and and I don't want to downplay his grief or anything, but I just feel like he handles the interaction with Barbara poorly, and yes, he should have ah uh, should have again. It. So that's too, why it's, it's, yeah. it's 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 sort of two two different things. Yeah. I think it is written beautifully. Mm-hmm. I and mean, I think I think the I think it is a great scene of Batman acting badly. So I just mm-hmm. want to cl- cl- clarify that. I yeah. think it's a, I, th- I think it's I, th- I think it is a terrific scene. Yeah. I like it. I don't like what's happening, but yeah. I like it. I like yeah, it. I get that. Reading reading about these fictional characters in this fictional world. It's yeah. it's it's pretty great. <laughs> Yeah, and and you know I'm just heavily I'm heavily critical on Batman as as Donovan is well aware. Mm-hmm. This just I mean, yeah. and, and 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 to some extent there is the sense of this hardly ever actually applies, but in this sense perhaps Batman is thinking of himself as the general. You know that he that he doesn't need to go out into the field of battle yeah. that he has. He he really does have these these other full these uh, his 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 trained team his trained soldiers. Yeah. I just feel like there is some other story, but I can't put my finger on it, where something happened with someone close to them and he denied anyone else from getting involved. And he's like, only I will do this. And so, I, you know, those are those are interesting dichotomies of Batman. But, you know, as a as someone who is pro and she's my number one girl, uh, you know, just seeing that happen and that she doesn't there's that that space for her physically, literally or, or figuratively for her to be there, I think is is really interesting. And so that's when I go back. Oh, I to, think it's very sad for Barbara. Oh, yeah. I think it's very it's a heart, heartbreaking moment for sure. Yeah. Yep. I, I go back to then that comment I made before where she needs to be that solid foundation for others because they can't handle it. And that's true here. Right. Like, oh, I think yeah. she could yeah. break down here. I think she could scream at him. But I think in that silent panel, you have that moment of this guy's not going to budge and it's not going to help for me to do anything. And so I need to be that that back for everyone to hang on. And so I think that this just attests to what a strong character that Barbara is and a character that she yeah. has. I mean, and m- yeah. One of my notes uh, uh, for the story is Babs is very good at her, at her job and the yeah. team is making progress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the team is making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess we could say, you know, Batman puts his trust in her. So, you know, maybe there's that positive action right there that he trusts her to get the job done. Anything else? Um, Birds of Prey number 27. Mm-mm. So then we get to Catwoman 90. And this was the only one that I felt like had a almost in medias race moment where it just is like really in the middle of uh, things and they're all chasing Catwoman. What do you think about this chase scene? Why do every member, why does every member of the Bat family need to be there? Does that just attest to Catwoman's skill in order to, to corner her? Yeah, probably. Um, and this is the issue that I have. Babs is very good at her job and the oh, team okay. is making progress. That applies That's to this true, one yeah. because she is coordinating this entire, this entire thing. And, and, you know, on an issue by issue basis, you know, having a, an issue that is basically a chase scene. Yeah. Sort of a, as a standalone, you know, isn't necessarily the greatest, but it's whatever, whatever it's chapter five out of eight or eight or, yeah. or, you know, wherever this fits in, it was a, it was a good action. I mean, it's, action set piece for the, you know, sort of taking the big picture of the storyline. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I talked about uh, 
Catwoman looking evil in that Robin issue. And there's one panel with her. I've got it on page 12 where they're interrogating her. And she says, I don't have a motive. I don't want Gordon dead. I hate his guts, but I want him around to see what I'm doing to his precious city. And just like her face (laughs) is like the most evil that I've ever seen her. And it's kind of like the, the quintessential, like evil female and got that spark coming out there and her pointed eyebrows and everything. So that, that was certainly well done there. And yeah, some good art moments. That is probably as much posturing as, as, you know, revealing a, a, a true feeling as well. Yeah, absolutely. One thing though, that did rub me the wrong way. And I wondered if you felt it as well is Tim's sense of humor in this particular issue seems inappropriate in the sense of we're in this serious situation. I've got to find this now. Um, And he's making light of it. Oh, uh, I've got one on page 15. I think there's another joke, but I can't remember. This was, she said, Catwoman tells him she knows where the gun is and she can let them know and then they'll let her go, hopefully. And then Tim says, we're going to have to check it out anyways. Besides, if she's lying, we can always capture her again. And he's laughing and then she comes after him and (laughs) Cass restrains her. But I felt like there was another one that was in the beginning when they were chasing. I don't know if I can find it, though. Uh, But anyway, I mean, just humor that's within this, whereas everyone else is pretty serious and, you know, trying to get this particular job done. Oh, wasn't it with the charge? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So page 10, uh, they've charged her in that net. And then he says she's down gang at the bottom. Guess we can forego plan B and it's rooster of the sea. So I guess he jokingly had some some tuna there. So is this just it's Tim. It's Tim's character, and he's trying to lighten the mood, um, and so that's okay. Or did you feel like, oh, this is kind of weird to have humor in this relatively serious storyline? Uh, probably a little bit of both. Uh, he, he, he seems to be the only character trying it, so that <laughs> sort of gives me, you yeah. know, it's sort of evidence that 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 the writer was not trying to do, you know, sort of the whole the whole the whole issue is not light uh, like that. And again, maybe in the in 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 the same way that you need the release maybe of the action sequence after the more intense uh, emotional stuff of prior issues. Maybe someone thought, well, we, maybe we need to crack a few jokes here too, just as a pressure release, you know, on the reader as much as yeah, as mu- much as anyone else. Um, although in both cases, uh, kind of epic fails yeah. in, in terms of actually attempting humor. Yeah. And yeah, I I agree with you. I think because the other person that you could expect to be humorous would be Dick, but he's been pretty serious the entire time. Uh, more importantly, probably Bab's best hair day. <laughs> she doesn't have many bangs, which was interesting. I was noticing yeah. that. Yeah. Her so her best of the issues that we've covered so far. I think so. I okay. think so. We'll see about Nightwing. Nightwing has been pretty consistent in the art okay, presentation okay. first, like, which actually is the next one. Do you have any other thoughts on Catwoman, number 90? Nope. Mm-mm. Okay, so yeah, Nightwing, which she appears often. So it's to be expected that she would appear in this particular one as well. Yeah, there she is. Yeah, so, I mean, since we're on it, what do you think about her hairstyle here? It's kind of got this weird, actually, this is A little not- bit shorter, a uh, little bit shorter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the artist is different than what I've been seeing. So it kind of, uh, the art style is not my favorite. And I'm yeah. just looking at her at the computer. And I'm like, that that is a weird representation of Babs right there. I mean, it's a weird representation of everybody. Again, it's, <laughs> to me, there's there's a lot of stylized yeah. aspects of everybody. And the other thing I was listening to, I had no idea which podcast it was, uh, but someone was complaining about uh, in in comics, Seems like everyone has round glasses. Mm. Like, do you see anyone in real life with round glasses? Everyone in comics have round glasses. And then that's in the back of my head. And I'm obviously paying very close attention to uh, Barbara's hair as the uh, chief stylist correspondent for that girl to Oracle. And I noticed not only is her hair different in this one, her glasses are different in this one as well. And I think, you know, if a character has round glasses, Anyone can draw them. Yeah. That, that is probably why, as opposed to if they're rectangular or some other oblong shape, you're not going to be able to get that consistent, the angles, yeah. the shape, the size. But if 
if it's a square or a or a circle any any artist can maintain can, can maintain that and that which a might be why so many characters in comics have round glasses mm-hmm. and b might be why characters without round glasses appear to have different glasses as often as they have different yeah. hairstyles might be true <laughs> yeah. yeah that's a good point i mean she may have switched to her readers for this scene as well, you know, sometimes you have, That's true. You, you have yeah. your backup pair. She may have run over her other pair. I'm just or, or those blue light glasses that everyone's buying since we went into online learning and teaching. Exactly. And exactly. Well. Yeah. A uh, little detail. I did love that Dick calls Babs a hero because I feel like we don't necessarily hear that moniker for her, though we right. do we consider her that, but just like not, cause I, I think the general thought is that someone who's out in the action is like right. the hero, but to have her who does so much work behind the scenes uh, be called, that was great. Uh, so the gun, this is a huge scene, uh, not only because she should hate guns for obvious reasons. And, and she had some opportunities back in, in suicide squad to take vengeance out with the gun. But uh what do you think about her hesitation in, in handing over the gun, the smoking gun, literally? Was it reasonable for her character? And then as a second question, if she hadn't gotten the call that her dad was up, uh, what would she have done, do you think? I don't have a feel for that second question. That's too many hypotheticals for me. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think hesitation is reasonable. And I think handing it over is reasonable. I, I think both of those steps are are, are probably uh, appropriate for a character. Yeah, I I see that as well. I think she um, it's similar to she and Montoya. I think are are similar in that you've got the emotion and then you've got the reason. I think combating and she's so mm-hmm. in the thick of it that the emotion I think is right there and that's what's causing the hesitation. But the the reason I think for Babs will always work out, especially if she mm-hmm. has someone to talk to her. In the Suicide Squad, she had Amanda Waller was talking to her. Right. So I feel like even if something had happened to her father she would have given it to dick though it may have taken more conversations and she probably would have that would be a terrible character arc to see what that would look like but yeah yeah i think it's a you know (laughs) the other thing that this team is struggling with the 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 hero team the bat family the Mm -hmm. bat team is struggling with is are we going to do this our way yeah are we going to do this the right way Mm -hmm. or or, are we gonna you know this this was an officer that was shot we think an officer did the shooting so do we let them handle it? You know, do we do we yeah. let the I mean, do do we let the court system handle? I mean, do do we do 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 we let them handle it? Do we handle it? Do we give it to Bullock and let him handle it? <laughs> um, I mean, to, to to some extent, you have three options there. Yeah. Right? we yep. take revenge. We let them take revenge, or we let the system uh, work it out. Yeah, and 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 you know, usually it's it's two choices: the mm-hmm. system or us. But here you sort of have that the third option. Do we let do we let Gordon's yeah. brothers and sisters and the force work this out? Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I I I think letting I think not handling it themselves in terms of the the team vigilante mm-hmm. I think was was probably a good a a, a good call and that's yeah. where that's where Barbara lands. Yeah, and doing it the way Gordon would approve of it or want it mm-hmm. done. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So Alfred finally leaves. What took him so long? <laughs> he's like, I've had know. enough. You haven't become. He, he's he's not, he's a baby. Batman's a baby, and Alfred's like, I'm out. I'm done. Well, again, we have the Foster family, the Foster father, the father figure, and we usually think of that from Batman's perspective, but we don't often think of it from Alfred's perspective. You know, he's he he has raised this boy. Yeah. And uh, right now he's not making good choices. Yeah. And sometimes you got to walk away and let the uh, let the person figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. I, Spoilers, I, I think he comes back. Yeah, I'm sure he does. And doesn't he leave him at one point during the Nightfall trilogy too? Could be. I feel like I remember reading all of that. But yeah, I mean, it takes a particular someone, I think, to speak truth to somebody else. And Alfred... Is that person, I think Alfred probably and Wesley as well, are, are the people in Batman's lives. And then Batman's just not hearing it at this point and in time. Actually, and that's certainly from a narrative or a literary perspective. You know, it's about 
you know, Batman losing to, to, to some extent, both of his father figures, yeah. right? you know, one is lying dead and the way he's dying and the way that he's behaving has, has driven the other one away. Yeah. So you've, you stripped him away from both of those um, positive influences in his life. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it is, I mean, Batman really does act like a child just because he's sulking. And I mean, grief, right? So I, I, I don't want to belittle grief, but it's certainly, it, mm-hmm. you know, Alfred really gets to it that everyone else is doing their job and trying to get the culprit and here you are, what are you exactly doing? And I feel like Batman hasn't moved for however long he's been there yeah. also. Uh, and then, yeah, he also makes the joke of, you know, if he dies, are you going to dress up like a bat and do this for the rest of your life? So it's like very cyclical, <laughs> right, right. like, you know, what what's going to happen there. So, you know, it, um, it, it yeah. is in in real life, I'd be hesitant to criticize the way that someone is dealing with stress or strain or grief or say being locked down for three months in their house. Yeah. Yep. You know, people are legitimately <clears throat> responding to that differently. Yeah. And I think giving people the grace, uh, uh, you know, to do that and, and to not require your response to be the same as my response. Um, there's some value in that. Although obviously here we're, yeah exaggerating that yeah uh, you know to make this to make this literary point as well but i i, I would I, I would uh you know hesitate to cr- criticize you know how, how on an individual basis how a friend of mine a good friend of mine yeah a, a spouse a good friend a child is is would be dealing in the in the aftermath there yeah. of a stress stressful grief filled situation yeah and we i mean as fans of batman and comics i mean dressing up like a bat after your parents are killed, you know, or training for that is not necessarily a reasonable response. So, I mean, it sort of is, yeah. it tracks, it tracks with the character right. that his responses will not be necessarily be reasonable. However, you know, much that I, I don't like what he's doing. So it's revealed that a, a cop did it. Was this anticlimactic for you? Do you feel like it fits with the story? Did you want it to be someone like really exciting and, oh, it's a shock, you know, this is someone here, but actually, no, it's someone that volunteered post no man's land and, and Jim has a con, uh, historical connection with him. I liked it. I, I liked it. I, and it, and it, again, to some extent you're laying Gotham central groundwork here, yeah. which to me is one of the best series DC has put out. Agreed. Yeah. I don't know this <laughs> millennium um, <laughs> in the, in the two thousands. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's terrific. And oh, so no. yeah. again, so here they're sort of, you know, laying in that laying the groundwork for that. And if if you think about it, however many people Gotham City has, you know, ten million people in it, uh, we know, you know we could list off what seems like an endless list of supervillains, but we'd probably struggle by the time we got into the seventies. Maybe that leaves a whole lot of other potential villains <laughs> and gen- generic bad guys, and you know, uh, lots of other people that can do harm to lots of other people. And certainly, folks who can who could bear a grudge against the uh, against the chief of police. It's not just Catwoman and Joker and Penguin yeah. who might be might be a little upset with Jim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think it was. I think to a certain extent, you might feel like it's anticlimactic because you do want it to be a famous big bad. But I think it's great that it's not because you were expecting that. And also, this is a very grounded book and. By that, I mean it's like on the streets. Catwoman's really the only person that we see that you could consider, you know, a villain in the rogue gallery. But everything else, I think, just circulates around people who are criminals on the streets and we don't have the Jokers or the Mad Hatters or whatever. And so Mm -hmm. to have the culprit be someone from the department from the police department keeps it really grounded. So I do like that. And you, you, you say that, and that strikes me that probably every one of the covers that we talked about is literally outside. Mm, Almost yeah. everyone is literally That's in true. that, in, in, in that alleyway or, yeah. you know, some, it's some version looking down on it, looking across it, but it's, it is all literally in, in, in the street. So they're, yeah. they are, uh, they're signaling that fact for us. Absolutely. Any other thoughts on Nightwing 53? No, again, I just I just like the way that the police stuff is written. You know, you add at least, <clears> the, <throat> whether it's verisimilitude or at least the comic book version of it. Yeah. You know, sort of the fictionalized version of it. That 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 you do actually don't always get in comic books, as mm-hmm. you were saying. You know, if this were 
any other name any a, any other villain you know major or minor or kite man or whoever it be you know <laughs> it, hell you know, yeah kite man <laughs> yeah i see what you did there yeah. it's uh but it's none of that like, yeah. like we said yeah and it's is, and, and 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 we're not tricked into that. I mean, we're not. Maybe as Batman readers, we're sort of expecting it. And yeah. maybe the, the 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 you said the Catwoman scenes are a nod to yes, this is a comic book, and yes, there's a there's a comic book villain that we are uh, going to include, but we're going to dismiss that pretty quickly because mm-hmm. it's something else that's going on. Yeah, and just a note to DC Comics: this is what I want for Barbara. Like, I feel like this is the time for mm-hmm. the Batgirl book to have something just like this, and it absolutely works. And that goes back to her time doing investigation and stuff in the Silver and Bronze Age. So that's what I would like to see. Well, you were talking about real life police work, and then we get into it big time with Detective Comics seven fifty four. The interrogation scenes, yeah, talk about the I like to call it choreography, but the scripting and the layout and everything of of those scenes. What do you think about all of that? Solid again, solid. Um, you know, this is you're 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 getting back to you know, Rucka again, writing this last one, and again, that's a that's a strength of his, whether it's his prose fiction or his comic book work, is is the is the police stuff, the crime stuff. Um, again, my experience is uh, with scenes like this is reading them or watching them. So again, it's it's uh, it's the uh, fictionalized version of verisimilitude or or what I would expect to happen or the the you know the techniques and, and and process of of interrogation i will correct you and say that dave philippus was the writer on this one so are you thinking about gotham knights i'm not sure okay yep thank you if Rucka does that but i mean the okay. same thing i mean yep. he he probably has taken his cues from Rucka mm-hmm. potentially but yeah just laid out yeah when i was reading it i was about to say watching it felt like a law and order scene you know the the first half when it was always the the cops before before the lawyer stuff, but just yeah, how it is choreographed with Crispus and Montoya, and then Crispus and Rich alone, good cop, bad cop. You've got all that going on. The the fake. We've got the stress of right. you only have 20, 12 hours with this guy. Can we get a confession? Crispus hates Batman. Don't bring that into it. Then they're kind of like at the end of that time and bring it in. Yeah, it's just almost as it goes on, you kind of feel this weight and this stress of, are they going to get that conviction? And then at the very end, wasn't it where he, he fakes, well, I guess it's not at the very end, but he fakes them out and you're kind of going along like, Oh, they're going to get something. Nah, I know what you're doing. I'm not going to give you anything. Uh, Yeah. Just really well done and great to see it on the inside and, and what these cops would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, as he leaves and everyone's watching him, Kind of, yeah, I, I don't know, like high school almost or like a player who did a terrible job in a game and is leaving the locker room, but he's walking out. And then, of course, Batman gets him and uh, he confesses to him, but that's not going to work. And then he comes to an interesting line that I want to talk about. He says, do you do do? Uh, he says, you're not going to kill me, question mark. You need a confession, question mark. And Batman says, I'll beat it out of you if I have to. And this guy says, go ahead. It can't hurt any more than losing everything. Gordon did enough damage to me to last a lifetime. And now I've done the same to him. So do you think, I mean, a lot of these questions that I've asked are like, is this reasonable? But the damage to last a lifetime. I mean, do you feel like Jim's crime against Rich equates to Rich's crime against Jim? From an objective outside reader perspective, no. But that okay. doesn't matter. It does to him. Yeah. It does to him. Yeah. That's what counts. Yeah. So, yeah, that history, of course, it, it goes back to that bar scene. And that's what Jim was talking mm-hmm. about, that he saw the the mother and the child. And so this guy, he lost all of that. And so losing all of that equates to, I guess, Jim now maybe losing his mm-hmm. life or just mm-hmm. being damaged enough to not. Because I don't know that Jim necessarily knows that. I, I'm not, I don't think the perp knows that Jim is going to retire at this point. But right. Um, yeah, good. it's just interesting because I wondered, like, would he have gone after Barbara? You know, would that have been a similar thing? But then I thought, I'm glad the writers didn't do it because then we've got another women in refrigerators situation going on and it's already happened to Barbara once. But yeah, it's interesting. A thing I, I like in that scene is that, as you said, in the in the in the official interrogation, he knew what was going on. He knew what they needed. He knew the, the legal aspects and, and here as well. Yeah. 
you know, Batman beating a confession out of him, it's not going to stand up in court. Yeah. At least not in this version, in, yep. in this, in this, you know, attempt to be sort of more realistic version yeah. of what, uh, of, of what a, what a court system would be. Yeah. Which is, I guess the scary. So, so, so he has no fear. Of yeah. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't, doesn't <clears throat> matter. Yeah. And I guess that's the real world fear and power of police is that, you know, if they do decide to go the dark side, they know the criminal justice system and they know how far they can go without, or Mm -hmm. they know the inside track of it. So that's, Mm -hmm. yeah, he's able to do that. But it's interesting to think about this guy. And I guess this plan had been fomenting for a long time. I guess so. Because he he joins up during no man's land. And so I guess it's reasonable because one of my questions was, didn't, wouldn't Jim have recognized this guy? Cause he recognizes him from the, the mugshot they gave him. But I think there was such an influx of volunteers right. that he wouldn't have foreseen that. But I guess the other question would be. And, what, and, and, and if he's at the top of, of an organization with literally thousands and thousands of yeah. people, you know, Kenny, yeah, and he really only knows, yeah, a handful of his uh, mm-hmm. his decorated officers. The other question, of course, would be what led him to do it at this point in time. And my assumption is just that story because he was around there and just maybe right. reliving it would would have mm-hmm. been the the trigger and like, well, I've got to get rid of this guy. Yeah, could be. Anything else on Detective Comics seven fifty four? Okay, so we move on to the final part, Gotham Knights number 13. No Babs. Why are we I even know, talking about it? Okay, the end. Bye. No, Fly no, on, no. Babs lovers. Oh, <laughs> good gosh. But that brings up, that was actually one of the questions that I had, the fact that there is that Barbara absence. Right. And I wondered why there was no scene between her and Babs regarding his retirement. Mm-hmm. Is it okay mm-hmm. that there was and we can just assume that it probably did happen? Do you think that was something that should have been in here, or is it just too much? No, too you, you, with- you, you had a lot to do. You had a lot to do in this <laughs> in this issue. Yeah. They, they, they had a lot to do in, in this issue. So l- let me ask you this. Yeah. What happened at the end? Yeah, so that's actually the, I have that question, right? So the assumption is, I think pretty heavily, that Harvey comes back, right? Mm-hmm. Because Harvey has that threat and to threatening face and then the quote uh see you later or see you soon i don't have it pulled up with me and some would say isn't that hypocritical because harvey was telling renee not to do it but we know harvey is not always on the up and up and we also know that he probably or i feel like while he would have agreed with the actual, I guess, violent act that Renee was thinking about, he wouldn't want her to stain her reputation or her conscience. Yeah. But he's someone that can take that on, kind of like a sin eater or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I feel like it heavily implies yeah, that he that did. kind of reminds me of yeah. The Departed. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, but when okay. Marky Mark comes at the end and you get rid of the bad guy, which is great. But yeah, what do you think? Do you think it uh, was Harvey? Do you think maybe the mob came across? Colin or something? The That's an option. That's yeah. an option. That's an option. I mean, it is, it is, uh, again, there are imp- imp- implications, but it is not, it is not clear. Yeah. And I do think it's interesting that like, like you said, I think, and you know, Harvey has been rebooted a couple of times. We have different versions. I mean, yeah. literally we have a, as you implied, he's a more cleaned up physical version in this uh, in this storyline, you know, whether he's a dirty cop or a rough cop or hanging out with Gordon has sort of, he's, you know, improved his game. Well, whether that's, that's uh, what we're to think, but I like the idea that whether it's his reputation, his past, whatever it is, whether he did this or not, he could have done it, but he wouldn't have wanted Renee to have done it. Yeah. Yep. The key, though, that was a bit of a question mark. So it does come back to the key. And then Montoya asks him where his key is. And he said he must have lost it. I mean, I guess that, that to me is the strongest indication. Yeah. But that, why would he that, have lost it? I Did he I did he literally lock him up and throw away the key, you think? I'm guessing that that is perhaps a metaphor. He is using Jim's metaphor. OK. That he lost the the that that uh, he went over the line. Gotcha. That he, uh, that, that to me is the closest thing to a confession <laughs> that, that, that Ooh, we'll get yeah. from him. I mean, yeah. that's, that's part of the evidence mm-hmm. to me that, uh, that he went back and finished the job. Yeah. Was that he's sort of saying that balance, that responsibility that we got in the first issue. Mm-hmm. He, he, he threw that away. He lost that. Yeah, that, that, that that's what he lost, not the physical object. Mm-hmm. 
So we can talk about the Jim and Batman scenes. Uh, we've got a rough one near the beginning and then comes back again. Uh, man. Does Jim, do you think Jim owes Batman any explanation? This is the the, the first one there. No. Okay. No. Yeah. No. But I don't mind that Batman thinks that. Okay. You know. Yeah. You know, relationships are like that. Friendships are like that. Even, mm. uh, even, um, uh, you know, pseudo parental, literal parental relationships are like that. Uh, any mentor mentee relationship, any human relationship, we, you know, the expectations of the various parties are not always aligned, are rarely aligned. Yeah. That's part of the gunk of humanity that we have to deal with. I guess I see it as hypocritical, though, because I think, you know, because you hate Batman. I just think he's a jerk. That's all I, I, I want him to be held accountable for his actions, but he rushes off, you know, n- that whole no man's land situation. He's gone and Jim didn't get any sort of notification. So that's, you know, I'm like, Oh, Batman, maybe you should yeah. uh, practice what you preach, but yes. you know, yeah. Another childish act where he's just like walks away from the conversation, <laughs> which is interesting. But they do have a more reasonable talk at the they end. They do have so a there is a, talk. a, a, uh, reconciliation, but yeah. a, at least a, a re- restoration of the yeah. relationship, I think. Yeah. And I'm glad it came back to actually some of those no man land conversation, no True. man's land. And yeah, and it's in his garden and everything. So it, it's nice, a, a symbolic location, which I like. Yeah. So it's a much better once he comes back. I'm glad it wasn't left with the angry words and he comes back again. And so I like that. But I like also that Jim, uh, another person that I think can speak truth to Batman says, you know, again, it's not about you. Right. <laughs> the world right. doesn't revolve right. around you, Batman. You know, he's it's just time for him to to go. And he was thinking of Sarah as well, which was sad. I was thinking, oh, what would Sarah do if she were here? Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. Do you feel like for Jim? Uh, well, maybe I'll say this. I'll say this uh, question. Yeah. Any, any for who? Uh, for, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, save it for the overall Okay. Yeah. For who? Yeah, I cook, I kick you off. I bring someone else on, and then I ask them questions that I refuse to ask you. <laughs> Could you imagine? That'd be really interesting. No. Any other thoughts? Yeah. On on Gotham Knights thirteen. Mm-mm, no. Okay. Okay. So now I've got these bigger questions here. So I'll start with the one that you thought I was going to ignore you. <sighs> Do you feel like this was always the way that Jim would go out and retire? Do you feel like he would always be forced out? in this way or do you think there was there would ever be a peaceful leaving again you're talking fictional versus <laughs> reality right because at some point at x number of years on the I mean, you have to force sure. retirement at some point right this yeah. is not a not an elected position it's an appointed position and there is you know, i'm sure a, a a mandatory retirement age but ignoring all of that stuff yeah um hmm you know i think he he has come up through the system and even though he has been tangentially or, or intersected with this whole other world of Batman and, and, and his family that I think he would probably, I, I don't have a problem with him retiring and saying, whether it's, you know, 25 years, 30 years, I've done my duty. I trust the system. I trust the people I've hired. I trust, okay, maybe not Bullock to take over, but I trust Montoya or Christmas yeah. Allen. There, 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 there are people, there are, are uh, deputy commissioners at, at Etc. The the department existed before me, though. To be fair, it was a you know corrupt hellscape. But uh, and he's turned that around. And at some point, you say, I can leave a legacy behind. Mm-hmm. And part of that legacy would be the organization yeah. and the people that that he's entrusted to uh, uh, to run it. Yeah. So I, I I think that's that's reasonable. Yeah, I would hope that he would leave on a high, that that Mm -hmm. it would be a peaceful transitioning and that, you know, I've done my job and my duty to the city and now I'm going to go off. But I also feel like he does. He is that type of man that would have to be forced out, like there's still more to do. Was it the last one we talked about? I can't remember what show it would be on, but did we talk about one where he got fired? Oh, that's Did we talk about that? I think I think, I think there was a storyline at some point where he got fired. Yeah, I and remember. Sarah was the commissioner. She, I mean, she was right. temporarily commissioner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so mm-hmm. so I, I I like this version of it more than yeah. that one, though. We always knew that one was going to be temporary. But. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I can see it, and 
Yeah, I wish it were under better circumstances, if only in terms of Sarah still being alive, because I feel like this man has endured so much trauma and tragedy mm-hmm. that you wish it weren't. But I, I think it's just the name of the game in Gotham. And I think he realized that coming down from Chicago, that this was a rough and tumble right. city. So, yeah, but yeah, I, I feel like he leaves in a in a great way. And he's got, for the most part, I think people that he can trust. Aiken seems like an okay guy, mm-hmm. even though Bat Jerk did not shake his hand. Yeah. To be fair, that was social distancing. And, oh, uh, boy. He's wearing and... gloves. Batman wears gloves. <sighs> Whatever. You don't need to bring your bat hate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I said I hate people who hate people. And I guess well, that person. I you hate, know what, yeah. Stella? I hate people who hate people who hate people. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Isn't there that quote of something that I don't, I love everyone except people from the Netherlands. It's some sort of (laughs) joke. I can't remember. It's like something people who hate people and people from the Netherlands or something Mm -hmm. like that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But anyways. No, that was about as good as, uh, as, as, as Tim's jokes during the, the That's because I don't too. remember it. I'll look it up while you're talking about this next question. So we were talking about just how fluidly this thing came together and that it's pretty well connected. Do you feel like the transitions between issues were strong? I, th- I think the ending of each issue was strong, you know, and that's the, that's the skill, the uh, sort of, yeah, yeah, you have to leave it with some level of cliffhanger or some, some level of drama. Mm. I thought those, I, I, I thought there was some, strength there though I, I think some of them stood alone better as individual issues and individual chapters than other ones did but you know it, it's a collected story and again from what i understand it came out in a pretty quick pretty quick fashion you know these are not i don't think we, we didn't get any particular title repeated i mean i think it it occurred in <clears throat> across basically one month of all the titles mm-hmm. of all the, all the titles in the in the bat family so it, it was a cohesive coherent uh, coherent story and I thought that was a that was a strength. Absolutely, yeah. I think the only one that I felt like the transition wasn't the best was into Catwoman, mm-hmm. just because I I would have liked more of an intro to this chase game. But it does right. come right after the Harley, letting them know where Catwoman is. So I guess there's enough connective tissue between the two. But otherwise, yeah, I think they do a great job. And yeah, I don't think the story would work if it were in one book one monthly book. I think right. what really helps it is that it was published within one month and reading it in one sitting. That's how I did it anyways. Right. And, 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 you know, and, 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 and the trick is when you've got seven or eight titles and you want to tell a story across it, you also have to make each chapter, you have to make that title character an important piece of it. So you have to have a Catwoman chapter because, Catwoman's book is being published this month. You have to have a Birds of Prey chapter. You have to, as opposed to say what, I mean, you have to have a Robin, you have to have a Nightwing, you know, they each have to have their own, their own, their own focuses, as opposed to say what the CW does when they have their crossovers, right? Right. Where it's basically five episodes of miscellaneous WB content. It seems like it's like, like the, the flash episode of the crossovers don't necessarily feel like flash episodes they are just mm. part two of five or part yeah. three of seven or part, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and, but I think here, I th- think they, they did a better job of making each chapter, you know, giving, giving the appropriate character you know, if to the case that there, that there was one, you know, giving Batgirl shines in the Batgirl story. Uh, Robin shines, et, et, et cetera. They shine, mm. they star in their book. Yep, very much so. Uh, so I found the quote. I thought it came from Austin Powers. It does. It was in Goldmember, and Austin Powers' father says this. He says, there are two thi- only two things I hate in this world, people who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the quote that I was struggling to get out. That was the joke. So anyway, there you go. Okay. Do you feel like there are more meanings behind the title? Yes, I think it's, you know, it's a case of using a, you know, a dramatic bit of police language and, and then, you know, perhaps taking it both in the case of our killer, maybe in the case of Bullock towards the end of bringing them down. Is that what you're, that what you're thinking? 
I, yeah, I feel like that's possible and that mm-hmm. they lost Jim anyway, right? He's right. still alive, that's but true. they lost right. him from the force. So I feel like there true. might be more than just that. Mm. But yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, on the surface, and most importantly, it is that there was an officer down, and that's the call that goes out when that happens. Mm-hmm. Now, let me, let me say this, <laughs> that I know that this is the July episode. Yep. But I love the fact that we are, in fact, recording this on Father's Day weekend. Oh. So happy Father's Day, Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> and happy pseudo Father's Day, Alfred. Yeah. And yeah, we're recording it on the day. Not so that... much happy Father's Day to Bruce because he's a little, little, little well, shaky there. Well, because he abused but... his child, one of his children mm, uh, in this Yeah, I mean, it's, it's imperfect. Okay. Yeah, we're also recording on the day that The Last of Us Part Two comes out. So after this is done, I'm skirt skirting over to GameStop and... Uh, All right, bye. Fly on, bad lovers. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. And it is also probably most importantly of all, Juneteenth, mm-hmm. which is great. So, mm-hmm. okay. So this is, I call it, the, it's like the summer blockbuster for me for this podcast. And I would consider it an event since it is going over several issues. Definitely. How do you feel like this story compares to other stories? And it is smaller than, you know, Contagion or No Man's Land, but just in in your reading and everything, how would you feel like this crossover rates? I enjoyed it a lot. I, I think it was very well done. And again, you know, I don't know the uh, editorial hand of, of Idelson and Shrek very well, but I think that side of it, keeping the trains running and keeping it organized and, and having those consistent covers, you know, having that, that trade dress, you know, so all, all, all of those little aspects of just putting the thing together. I think um, uh, I think uh, was impressive, and again, you know, I certainly give Dixon and Brew Baker and Rucka most of the credit for the for the story. But like you said, I mean, every, I think every, everyone involved did a did a did a pretty good job. Would you recommend this to someone who's starting out in Batman comics? You feel like this is new reader friendly? I, th- I, th- I think it's not bad for that because it, it you you get to see, you, you get to meet the whole family. A whole, a whole bunch of the family, and and I, th- I think the writing is good enough that you can interpret and see and intuit the relationships that are there. You don't always need, and this is Bruce (parentheses Batman Wayne), and this is uh, this is Barbara Gordon, who used to be Batgirl, but it's not. You mean you, you you don't need all those asterisks and and all of that. You can you can figure it out. You know, yeah. And I think, and again, realistic or adult or mature, those aren't, you know, words you necessarily can be odd definitions when you apply them to comics, but it certainly had had that little more grown up feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is exceptionally well written. I think that even though it's not a huge crossover, I think it, it deserves to be up there in the in the towers of crossovers. I don't know, the pillars of crossovers. Uh, I think it is, for the most part, new reader friendly, though someone who is looking for Batman, I feel like it's not a Batman right. story. I mean, it's, right. honestly, it's a Batman family story. It's a yeah. yeah, greater world. Again, I mean, it's, it's a GCPD. I mean, yeah. I, I, I read them the other way around. I read GCPD first, mm-hmm. and then, then you know, came back to this the other way around. But yeah. obviously the, the, the DNA is there. Yeah, and however much I rag on Bat Jerk, I think for a new reader, I wouldn't want to put this for it because then you're kind of right. you're getting a really bad opinion of of Batman and how he acts here. And you know, while I do focus on these times, he doesn't act like that all the time. But I mean, the the nice thing is a quote unquote <clears throat> new reader yeah. is going to be bringing knowledge of Batman and Dick Grayson and Catwoman and Barbara Gordon and Commissioner Gordon. At least those core characters, yeah. you know, not Tim and not Cass and not Azriel necessarily, you mm-hmm. know, they might not know those characters, but just from cultural osmosis. Yeah. Sort of every, if you're on the TV show 50 some years ago, everybody knows you, who yeah. you are. And so, <laughs> you know, this is, this is not going to be, you know, someone's, I don't think someone's going to be scarred by reading these, yeah. the, this interpretation, this version of Batman. Absolutely. Yep. And and I will just say uh, or repeat what Alan had said several minutes ago that I highly, highly, highly recommend Gotham Central. Yes. It is one of the best things that I've ever read from DC Comics. And it's all it's it's a 
cop procedural, but even calling it that almost short changes right. it and, and really getting to know Renee Montoya and, and crafting her into the great character that she is now. Mm-hmm. So, and this is, yeah, a, a great gateway. So if you enjoyed Officer right. Down, I really recommend that you go and pick up Gotham Central. And I think there are just four trades, so they might be oversized. Yeah. So I think it's about 40 issues. I yeah. Think. So, so it's completely, so wait for like a BOGO sale on, <laughs> oh, BOGO on, Co- I know now we're talking money on Comixology. <laughs> Don't get how excited he gets. Uh, I think that's how I did it actually on Comixology because you're getting. I believe I got them from too. the public library. Oh, there you go. There you go. That also, cause that's for free. It is. <laughs> okay. It is. Any other thoughts before we give a rating on this story? No, it's excellent. Spoilers okay. for my rating. Okay. Well, let's see. Out of 10... Handcuff keys out of 10 handcuff keys. Yeah, we'll go with that. What would you give this story? It depends what the standard is. It's an A. It's an A. So is it 10? Is it nine and a half? Is it nine? Like, do you say, is, is the standard the perfect story? In which case it falls short of that. In other words, is there any story that I'd give a 10 to? I don't know. But if I were going to give 10 to multiple stories, this would be one of them. That's the closest you're going to get out of me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's an A. It's an A. Okay. I no, you know, I feel you there. And my I actually really want to give it a 10 out of 10 handcuffs. I think the only thing that detracts from it is the art on those two issues, Nightwing and True. Robin, That's to be fair. honest. That's fair. But story, I mean, honestly, yeah. So it's, like, you know, 9.5 if you're bringing in the art, but a 10. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I just think it's it's really well written. And even though I hate how Batman acts in it, it's reasonable given his character. And I really feel for Barbara, but it's, I, I thought it was an amazing story. Thank you so much for being on with me to do this. I'm glad we got to do this one. Finally, it took a year at least of like, I think it'll be next summer. So here I- we are. I did read this a long time ago. I know. I remember like eight when you months told ago. Me. I said, okay, I'll, I'll read this. I'll make my notes. When are we recording? 2047? What? <laughs> I know. You were ready way in advance. I was, I was like, prepared. oh. I, I didn't realize you were yeah. that organized. Whew. Well, I've got, I yeah. mean, in talking to Tom, it doesn't seem that way. He doesn't seem to, to feel that way. But whatever. whatever. He's the intern. He doesn't know organization from a Good messy point. sock drawer. Good point. Good point. Okay. Well, next up is Chris's Cornucopia of Curiosities. Ah, that's like having no cable, internet, or Wi-Fi. Thank you very much, Stella. Hello, Batfans. Welcome once again to the Chris's Cornucopia of Curiosities segment. Thank you very much for downloading, and as always, thank you for not fast-forwarding. My name is Chris, and I am very glad to be with you. Today, I'm reviewing Batman Adventures number 32, taking a quick look at Batman The Adventures Continue number 1, and in the Nightwatch segment, Nightwing number 71, Nightwing Annual number 3, and the young adult graphic novel, The Lost Carnival. Batman Adventures number 32 was cover dated June 1995 and cover priced at $1.75. For this one, we have the creative team of Dan Raspler as the guest writer, and Mike Parabic and Rick Burchett were credited as the artists, and Rick Taylor was the colorist. The Batman was created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger. This story was reprinted in the Batman Adventures trade paperback, Volume 4, and does appear to be available on DC's Comics app for $16.99 for the entire trade itself, however, not the individual issue, and our story today is entitled A Soldier's Story. Act 1. Into the Valley of Death. Under a Gotham City streetlight, Batman finds eight men shot to death, each wearing a perfect replica of a 19th century Napoleonic soldier, and apparently ambushed. Traces of gunpowder lead Batman to a factory owned by 88-year-old Hezekiah Hood Jr., who just inherited his father's fortune. A noise outside directs Batman to a red coat, blue coat battle. He saves a boy and finds a fallen soldier who turns out to be a hood named Marty Schmarty, who implies to Batman that he came into some money just before he dies. The trail leads Batman to a horse stable where he finds 87-year-old owner Rupert Fletcher, the fourth, had just inherited his father's fortune. Batman calls Commissioner Gordon. Act 2. War and Remembrance. Batman tells Gordon that the new heirs knew each other for over 80 years and were childhood rivals and also played with toy soldiers. Meanwhile, another intense battle is taking place in a park. Meanwhile, in the Batcave, Alfred and Batman ascertain the battle location is Waterloo Park, naturally. Act 3. The Last Battle. At Waterloo Park, Batman arrives and commandeers a horse and joins the battle. There is a six-page action sequence, 
and Batman misdirects a cannon shot to a water tower, cooling off all the participants. Gordon tells Batman, after seeing Hood and Fletcher incarcerated, and still playing with toy soldiers, that you can't teach two old rich sociopathic dogs new tricks. The end. My notes, Dan Raspler's dialogue is a bit more wordy here, well, certainly in the initial chapters, which is quite noticeable from the usual norm in this title, versus, say, writer Kelly Puckett. And that's okay. Parabek gives us a lot of fine action sequences and a bit more in epic scope with a battle in a park and that great water tower sequence. But as I was reading this, I really didn't feel any connection to the villains. These are a couple of eccentrics, and we see very little of them, which in turn made me feel disconnected somewhat from the story. Yes, there were elements of danger, peril, and mystery, but this story had me feel that the villains were something that John Steed and Emma Peel might have taken on in the 60s Avengers TV series. This isn't a bad story, but it's not one of the best either. I would have preferred that we got to see and get to know the villains a bit more. The art, however, from Parabek was outstanding. With that, I'm going to give Batman Adventures number 32 a generous 6 out of 10 bats. Now for everyone's favorite segment within a segment, it's Nightwatch. That's where I look at the current issue of Nightwing from a shipper's perspective. At the time of this recording, Nightwing number 71 is the current issue, with writer Dan Jurgens and art by Ronan Cliquet. This is a Journey to Joker War crossover. Spoilers ahead, as Rick, oh, I thought we were going back to calling him by dick by now, and B share coffee at B's bar, Rick hears a commotion outside. He changes into his costume as Nightwing, and he fights Tusk. As if on cue, Joker enters B's bar and discloses that the Joker knows all of Dick's identities. Nightwing returns, only to be quickly hypnotized by the Joker with the memory crystal and seemingly under the Joker's control. To be continued. Okay, not much on the romance side here. And I guess any mental conditioning Dick had with Batman and Spiral with hypnosis has to be rendered useless by now due to his head and brain injury. And we see that Dick succumbs pretty quickly to this hypnosis. With that, I'm going to give this story no, repeat, no shipper alert. Next up, Nightwing Annual number 3 with the creative team of writer Dan Jurgens and art by Inaki Miranda. It gave us some flashbacks to the Dick Grayson Nightwing, the origins of Condor Red, recently seen in the title, and a battle with Blockbuster. Jacqueline Hale is the owner and founder of the Condors, a private, secret, weaponized ops group for hire that tries to recruit Nightwing. Miss Hale does slap Nightwing's butt as they tour Condor headquarters, and Dick ultimately turns down their offer. I think a butt slap by a potential employer would be deemed as sexual harassment, but I doubt the Condors have any HR department. I don't know if I can deem this under any type of shipping alert, but Miss Hale does seem attracted to Nightwing, and I'll leave it there. And finally, the young adult graphic novel, The Louse Carnival, it's a 1699, 198-page book, and it depicts a pre-Nightwing Dick Grayson. I'll try not to spoil it too much. Dick, at least 16 years of age here, as we see him driving a car, is performing with his parents, the Flying Graysons, at the Haley Circus. His best friend is Willow, a female magician and fellow performer around Dick's age. The Haley Circus is worried about the Lost Carnival, who has more interesting acts, and they draw much bigger crowds. Dick Lee meets Luciana, a magician in her own right from the Lost Carnival, who displays her own incredible magic powers, and Dick falls in love with her. The book has tender moments, a kiss, character introspection, self-discovery, decision-making, and ultimately some peril with other dimensions as Dick's best friend is put in mortal danger. This was a fast read as thicker books go, but it had a lot of heft and a lot of heart for the money. It is a love story, and I have to give The Lost Carnival a major, repeat major, shipper alert. This concludes this edition of Nightwatch. And finally, real quick, a look at another Batman book, Batman The Adventures Continue Number 1, based on the old animated series. Can Batman stop a giant robot, thwart Lex Luthor, and find a missing Superman all in one issue? <laughs> well, you may guess the answer, but I did enjoy this book a lot, and I am giving it 7 out of 10 bats. Ellen Burnett and Paul Dini were the writers on this one, with Ty Templeton on the art. Listeners, don't forget you can also find Stella on the Required Reading Podcast. I'd like to give a shout-out to my friends, the Sutherlands. Be sure to check out their fine podcast on the Rad Adventures Network. If you have any feedback for this segment or for the podcast, please head on over to the Batman Universe website. And if you'd like to lend your support to the Batman Universe website, which has news, features, and a fine family of podcasts, follow the links to Patreon or by making a one-time donation with a link on the Batman Universe homepage. Thank you for your support. 
Listeners, you can also find me on the Professor Frenzy Show, where my friend Jerry has some great upcoming projects. You can find us discussing new independent releases on a weekly basis. You can also find us on the Memory Minute Monday and Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Stories podcast. We're also on YouTube. Please do us a favor. Check it out. And if you like what you see, click the like button and subscribe. Thank you very much. Will anyone lose their lives when Bruce Wayne, once again, faces a mugger in an alley? What unlikely stolen item will Batman retrieve, and for who? Will Bruce Wayne lose another potential love due to Batman? Don't fail to listen to the next podcast where the answers to these aloof, alluring, allegorical alerts will be accounted for next time. Same Stella feed, same Stella sight. And now, I think this is it, isn't it? This is the reason why people come on my show. <laughs> Actually, before we do that, could we, you've already shown yours, but oddly, I, I tell people, this is only the second time, but I told Carolyn and Donna, I was like, could you please wear some item of comic paraphernalia or pop culture? And so, yeah, so this is what should, what are you wearing segment? Uh, so we've got Doom. There he is. And, you know, I would make a, you know, a, a pre-literature recommendation would be the ongoing Dr. Doom uh, comic from Marvel Comics, which is on a little bit of a hi- hiatus in these uh, uh, coronavirus yeah. days. I think it's scheduled. The next issue is scheduled to come out in September or something, but it's an excellent book. What's the creative team on that? Uh, Christopher Cantwell and Salvador La Roca. Oh, okay. So and great art. Yeah, Cantwell sounds familiar, but I'm not sure that I've read anything. Mm-hmm. Now, are you saying, <laughs> do you really like it because it's actually good? Or is it because it's like, you know, Doom is your favorite character so a slash person in the world so you, you let's just say that my views of dr doom and dr doom related content is not dissimilar to the view of this podcast regarding one barbara gordon that there oh, is no. a there is a a bent towards okay. stories yeah. that treat that character well okay I feel you there. Yeah, and so I, uh, I've i got a Captain Marvel hat on, and then I was going to wear my Last of Us shirt since it's Last of Us, but then I realized, oh, wait, I'm going to do a special show. I should t-. So I ended up wearing the Batgirl. Got all the Batgirls on it. Nice. Even Bet. Even Bet is there. So there you go. The Bat hyphen girl is represented. So well, so one of that. the uh, and and one of the things we've been doing uh, during quarantine <laughs> over here is the latest. I guess it was last year's iteration of DC superhero girls cartoons. Yeah. And uh, Babs is a, is a uh, lead character there. She sure is. And is a very interesting take. <laughs> She's <way>. hyperactive. <laughs> a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. So now, now I guess I'll call that, I should call that, I, I'll type this in my document. So I have it. The, what are you wearing? <laughs> segment. Oh, boy. Okay. So now is the segment where everyone only comes on the show for this. It is literature recommendation time. I will defer to my guest for his list before I give mine. Well, I am bringing a novel to the table, and this is a novel of a pure woman faithfully presented, gifted and beautiful peasant descended from a decayed aristocratic family. Our heroine is betrayed by two men, one rich and violent, the other intellectual and hypocritical. She is one of the most striking and tragic heroines of classic literature. The compelling story is first, you should appreciate this, Stella, a romantic tale of love gone astray. Second, it's an indictment of the British class system revered by some Victorians. And finally, it's an inquiry into what fates control the human destinies. This is the novel that lifted Thomas Hardy to a position of world fame. Oh my gosh. is Tess of the D'Urbervilles. You are a sick individual. Greatest novel ever. And of course, we do have to tell our Thomas Hardy joke, right? If if, If you want it to have a happy ending, you start here on the last page. And then you work your way forward. <laughs> like a manga novel. <laughs> you, you read it like a manga and it ends uh, happy. That's the way it ends happy. Uh, it starts that way. It starts kind of a downer. Spoilers. Yeah. But um, man. So, yeah, this is, I mean, for people who don't know Alan and my relationship, I mean, this is a constant thing 
And I've read Tess of the D'Urbervilles. I was very much engaged, but also I wanted to chuck the book across the room. I did finish it. <laughs> I mean, um, the biggest issue I had for this segment was if I brought the hardcover, oh, yeah. if I brought the paperback, if I showed you yeah. the How many do audiobook, you have? the audiobook version. Just those, just those three. At this oh, point, three. I think. Okay. Well, it's rank. and then we've got uh, "Far from the Madding Crowd," Mary "Oh my Caster gosh. Bridge," all the other Thomas Hardy. <gasps> Oof. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for that. I guess I should have seen it coming. Do you have anything else to recommend? Between Tess and Doctor Doom, is there anything else? Is there? Okay. Is there? Okay. I, you heard it here, folks. Well, I've got some things to recommend. Not as many as last time, which is good. I read Assassin's Creed Odyssey by Gordon Doherty, and it's basically a novelization of the game, and it's in Cassandra's perspective. I read Doctor Sleep by Stephen King, which is the sequel to The Shining, and Danny is now Dan Torrance. And Didn't I hear you talk about that? Did you guys talk about that on uh, on Required Reading? Someone oh, talked about I may have that mentioned okay. it, or at least, I mean, we, well, because I just, we just did The Green Mile. That's right. And so I think I mentioned that. I picked something that probably maybe people wouldn't expect for a first, you know, King, and yeah. Uh, let's see. On Goodreads, oh, this is in a, a foreign language, unless I'm having problems. But any, it's his... It's a sequel, and I really like the the villain. The antagonist is great, Rose the Hat, so I recommend that. And then I did watch the film, which is a marriage between a sequel of the film, The Shining, as well as the book. So uh, I'm not sure if people thought highly of it or not, but it was, it was pretty good. I did finish listening audio, it, the complete stories and poems of Edgar Allan Poe, which was 40 hours, nice. so you can imagine how that. long that took. <laughs> to read the all good that. Thing is, good thing is that put you in a positive headspace. Oh my you gosh. Need, yeah, they you, were all... You know what you need to cheer you up after that? You Actually, know that probably is... That? Yeah, Same. that probably is lighter. There's one about a cat that he... like. This guy abuses this cat and then the cat dies and then he gets a new cat. He murders his wife because he's angry at the cat. He sticks the wife in the wall, but he actually enclose the cat with the wife and so there's this investigation and the cat is making noise and then they find the dead body it's like this what is this i read prodigal summer uh by barbara kingsolver which will be the next episode of required reading with nice. tom and stella and then i all uh, my last one I, that's where it should be honestly thank you sir uh and then finally the opposite of fate memoirs of a writing life by amy tan and so several oh, essays nice. and things like that which was great yeah i've read her joy luck club so that's my other intro to her but she's humorous and funny a lot of her stuff she's got a, a good wit about her so those are my recommendations uh so that's it so before of course we close out i'd like for you well number one thank you i want to thank you for everything oh. for the recaps well, and You're just welcome. being here yeah i had a lot of fun and i'm glad we got to do this and thanks for being willing to do it on video can you tell listeners where they can find you uh most of most of what we do is at the relatively geeky podcast network that's me and my late 20s child m the two <laughs> of us host a bunch of different shows mainly my solo show the quarter bin podcast which is where we talk about the best kinds of comics, cheap comics, comics that often, maybe not always, but often cost around 25 cents given inflation over a number of years. Plus, you know, a I like to think of it as a flexible attitude towards uh, definitions. You know, language changes, Stella. Yeah. Words, meanings change over the years. And I think it's important for you. I don't mean listeners. I mean you to keep that in mind. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, that is also the home of Doom Speak about the greatest hero of all of comics, second only maybe to Barbara Gordon. And that is Dr. Doom. Have you considered shipping that? Anyway, but the key, what? <laughs> Those are available at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com. And then a few years ago, Em and I also had a got a side project going based on our interest, not just in pop culture and comics, but religion and theology and church history. And we came up with Dorkness to Light, and uh, which we've done some episodes of as well. And negotiations have long been underway to get one Miss Stella to appear on Dorkness to Light as and, a guest. And one day yeah. it might happen. And I've got the comics that we're going to do. 
Shh, spoilers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I won't say what it is. Please. But yeah, by Charles. That is correct. <laughs> Don't call him Chuck. Yeah, he doesn't go by that 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 time. Yeah, I've listened. I've actually listened to several episodes. I yes. think across the yeah, because you had a. I think you had a Turok tie-in, didn't you? Issue or episode? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And so I listened to that and um, Watchmen and Kingdom Come. So I've listened mm-hmm. to several. It's okay. just I'm not a regular. Yeah. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Yeah. Well, thanks again for coming on. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Yep. Uh, remember, you can send any questions or comments to backrolloracle at gmail.com. Uh, if any of the listeners or viewers have anything to say to you, do you want to give your email address? Relatively geeky at gmail.com. There you go. And he's also on the Twitters under two handles. One of them is a nicer person and the other one is not. <laughs> So one of them will plague you and troll you with doom images with him and a teddy bear and the other one will not. So just be aware, depending on which person you address. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also find the show on Google Play and Stitcher as well as, of course, YouTube. And now you can subscribe. So the it's just back the Oracle, no spaces for the YouTube channel. And I mean, the bonus about that is number one, you're getting this way early because this audio episode is coming out in July, but you're going to get the video in June. So there's the bonus, but you, and you get to see if I make mistakes, which I did during this episode, but you don't get any musical cues. So you won't know really what I'm, I'm playing or anything. Uh, like the show on Facebook or follow it on Twitter at Batgirl the Oracle. Follow the Batman universe on Facebook and Twitter as well. And remember, Fly on, Babs lovers. We're not there. Oh, sorry. sorry. <sighs> remember to support the Batman. It's like you have Tourette's. Support the Batman universe by subscribing to Patreon. And once again, thanks to Mile High Comics for sponsoring Batgirl the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. For n- no, no. Next time next episode which will be another july episode and the video will definitely come out in july as well it's actually going to be a the last of us part two special and i feel like with all the things that i want to and i feel like we need to talk about that it's going to be a long one i'm i've told my co-host like maybe three hours so just be prepared for that (laughs) uh yeah and that might be an explicit tag just because if i put in I know. If I put in any clips from the game, that's a mature mm. game and it's got the F word and such. So just be aware of that and content that we'll be talking about. So By I'm excited about F- that. F word, just to clarify, you mean fantastic or four? Friends. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. F is for friends that do stuff together. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to kick this man off so I can go to GameStop and get my game and load it Play up. Play on, bad lovers. <laughs> no. <laughs> no Gosh. Okay. Until next time. Fly on, Babs lovers. Ooh, boy. Yeah. Thank you for calming down on that last one. Just plain Barbara Gordon masquerading for a lark as she rides into the night on her special Batgirl cycle. Who knows? Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? Only time will tell us more about this dazzling dare doll. Ah, I love a happy ending, don't you?